recording. So you should have heard that. And, and what I'll do is you actually get an audio and you get, um, if you chat either to, uh, in the, I think in the group, we will get a recording of the chat messages that go into the group. And also there'll be a video and audio recording and I'll post that to the MFMP channel. So my, my reason for doing this uh, is because I promised uh, WP for Truth that we would um, uh, give him an opportunity to present his uh, work. And also if there's any sort of general questions, it's, it's sometimes a bit difficult for people to ask questions and in, in a presentation and so forth. Um, there's a couple of other things that I want to address, uh, which is uh, we need some assistance in uh, the Netherlands. So if there's uh, some followers uh, or people that know people in the Netherlands that are interested in working particularly, particularly on Vega experiments, uh, that would be great uh, if they can help there. So please let me know. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, ICCFs in general and the uh, up and coming ICCF 23, which is being held in China. So um, I haven't signed up for the ICCF 23 yet, because uh, if I do, I, ha I have to say I can't record or talk <laughs> or show anything about it. You have to click a button to say you can't do anything. Um, so uh, this, is, this is unfortunate. It says, I understand that storing of content presented at ICCF 23 is strictly prohibited in any form or format. Hampering with this may lead to the exclusion from the meeting. So um, I will talk about two presentations I know a little bit about because I saw a preview video from them. And uh, they're kind of like opposite ends of the spectrum with the kind of things that we've been talking about. And I want to uh, show you some things uh, from the Vega Valley uh, and, I, and talk about something that we're going to do with that imagery. But I think it already, you can see from the first uh, image that there's a, a lot that people can learn from it. Okay, so we have, how many, we have 15 people in the room. Someone just accidentally dropped out. I find uh, this happens all the time. So I'm going to send a message to you for the registration form for ICCF 23. If I can... Michael, stop it. You got to get out of here. You got to get over here. <sighs> so this is the registration form for ICCF 23. And so it's free to register and um, you can, they, they'll send you links to the, um, uh, the sort of uh, abstracts and stuff, but they've actually got that on this uh, link, which I'll also put into the group chat. I don't know. I think I'm, I'm, I need to send this to everyone. So th this is the abstract. So if you want to go and read the abstracts, they're there to everyone. And the registration for ICCF 23 is this link. So let's see if this works. Okay, so we've got 15 people in the room now. Okay. So um, it, when I first went to um, Russia in, to see Alexander Parkhamov in January uh, 2000, uh, was it January? February, February 2015, um, uh, I was impressed by the monthly, in fact, uh, was it monthly? Yes, the monthly, last Thursday in every month. Uh, Samsonenko, uh, that is the guy that's just had his 80th birthday celebration over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, Nikolai Samsonenko, he has for 20, 25 years or so held a basically an open meeting in the Moscow Friendship University. And essentially scientists in the field and on the periphery of it could come along and other people could listen in and uh, there were some incredibly um, capable people when I gave my presentation. And what, what, it, what it showed me is that there probably isn't um, an equivalent in the West. And maybe with this platform uh, as an example, uh, we could have a, a once a month meeting where people with various technology or ideas or criticisms or uh, you know, general thoughts uh, for direction and so forth, could come along and uh, 
um, make presentations in a sort of similar way to the Klimov Zaletin, Zatalepin presentations that have been going on over the winter in uh, Russia. And I've shared a good number of those. In fact, I've got another one to share probably. I'll do it uh, tomorrow morning. Um, but uh, I've, I've learned a lot for those from those. And one of the, the uh, presentations in that series was from actually last year on June the 17th last year. And that was the one that I talked about recently where uh, Anatoly Klimov, I think having seen work of Slobodan Stankovic in uh, ICCF 22 in September in 2019, was a bit shocked that he saw something that he recognized, uh, but actually whilst he thought um, Slobodan might have been using some microwaves to excite a plasma and uh, a spark discharge from a capacitor bank to create a capillary flow uh, uh, um, plasma ejection. Uh, I think they call it um, uh, erosion discharge from the capillary. Uh, he, he was surprised to find that uh, I, I imagine that there was no such spark discharge and there was no uh, uh, ionization chamber with microwaves going on. It was literally just uh, Brown's gas at HHO. And um, so it, that was important. And I think that it, that was actually data that they had since I think 1980s or even maybe earlier, because they were large format prints that he was showing that I shared forward. And uh, these are the kind of things that um, when people are regularly showing their work, it might stimulate others to bring more work it, that is in context and show that they are the same effect, effect, but they are being achieved in very different ways. So it's more of a fundamental effect rather than a technological, particular technological solution driven effect. And uh, that actual work, I think he has extended now um, for his ICCF 23 presentation. And I've seen a preview kind of like a video abstract, which you can probably get off the ICCF 23 website. And in that, he shows um, that he is basically using argon and he is ionizing that with microwaves. Uh, can, it, can everyone hear me? If there's, has anyone got a problem before I start talking shop? <laughs> anyone got a problem? We have 15 participants. Well, well done for those that are doing this for the first time. <laughs> okay. So who we got in the room? Anders here at foot. That sounds like you might be in uh, Holland. Uh, if you are Anders, then it would be great if you could consider maybe assisting a Vega experimentalist there. Okay, great. I can hear Anders is saying uh, he's in uh, Switzerland. All right. Um, uh, hi, Artifact there in Germany. Kristin Danocker, I don't know where you are. Maybe you can shout in the general chat where you're from. Uh, hi, Dan M. Hi, David Batulia. We know where you are. <laughs> uh, hi, David Davis. It's finally great to see you. I've never seen you before. So there we go. This is the first time. Um, uh, so maybe, maybe actually before I go in to talk about um, the uh, up and coming presentation of, um, uh, uh, who should we put it, uh, our, our Russian friend, before I go into that, maybe people could introduce themselves if they wish. So um, if I call your name out, could you unmike, unmute your mic? And um, if you wish, uh, unmute your mic and your camera if you have it and introduce yourself. So uh, uh, Simon's at the top of the list for some reason. So Simon, would you like to go? Oh, hey, Bob. Well, thank you. First of all, thanks for all your fantastic work. I watch it with great anticipation every week. Thank you. Uh, my name much. is actually Simi. And yeah, I'm in the United States. I'm looking at this from a US perspective. And I, I've been studying so-called paranormal phenomena for about two, three decades. And I've always been curious what the balls of light are, the orbs. It's around UFOs, crop circles, uh, even Bigfoot, all sorts of phenomena. And it's what is it? So that's my interest in looking at this and connecting it back to Leonard Cold Fusion. Fantastic. Great. Well, you're right at home here, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. OK, so uh, if you can kill your mic, you can leave your camera on. That's great. Um, and uh, can we uh, have Anders Herdford? 
Hereford. And if I spell your, say, say your name wrong, <laughs> correct me, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a I am a member of the Danish and Swiss uh, associations for free energy and have been that for many decades. And I have met Bob uh, two or three times at conferences. <clears throat> so, so I'm well informed, but unfortunately I don't have a lab at the moment. I have a lot of equipment in moving boxes, uh, but not a lab. Uh, that's it. Well, that's uh, sad to hear, and maybe uh, there can be a way to found, found to to <laughs> correct that problem for you. Okay, so thank you very much, Anders. Uh, good to have you with us. Artifact, do you want to join us? <laughs> uh, so again, same. Uh, kill, kill you. Well done. Okay, if you don't want to speak, Artifact, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so uh, all right. Okay, Christian, do you want, do you want, a, do you want a Christian de Nocker? Okay, Dan M, do you want to speak? Okay, you need to unmute your mic. Okay, so, yeah, this, can you hear me? All right. Yep, perfect, perfect. Uh, good to see everybody. Bob, thank you for your magnificent work. Like, this is just incredible. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'm in... Uh, the Northwest United States. I uh, I was sort of lucky to be like on a um, bit of a Forrest Gump Thunderbolts uh, like electric universe path. So anyway, I got to meet like a lot of the cool people in that community and, and the ones who worked on Leonard. And so anyway, that sort of, yeah, pushed me towards this. And then I discovered Rife stuff. And so I've been working with solid state Rife devices for a long time. Well, not a long time, for about a year. And it's been really eye-opening. So anyway, I'm really grateful to learn more and to just uh, watch everybody work and yeah, soak up as much as possible. So thanks for everybody's, you know, input and experience. Fantastic, Dan. And and like I say, it sounds like you've got some experience to share there and, and probably a once a month, maybe if people had a half an hour slot, they can share their experience. You know, what I find is that um, people underestimate um, the things that they've observed and sometimes they don't know whether they're just going mad and that they observe it or not and it's only when people come together and they share their information that they find that oh well, actually i observed something similar and then they can compare notes and move things forward so thank you very much it'd be interesting and and, and also anders if you've got experience from your research that you've probably done in the past i should imagine if you've got a lot of equipment so it'd be great to hear some of your uh, personal experience okay so uh david Vitier. Bitilia, you can say your name correctly. Yeah, it's Dave Boulier, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm just kind of a experimenter in my own rights, and uh, I've been experimenting with Tesla coils and stuff like this for a number of years now, maybe 15 years. Uh, managed to make some small artificial ball lightnings, eh, just that kind of stuff. I'm into electronics and all that type of other experimentation. So. Actually, I think there's one of my beauties behind me. So that's about it for me right now. <laughs> so D David's not lying when he says he's made some uh, little ball lining. I I've had the pleasure of seeing that. And I, I hope that he has uh, to share that. If you wish to talk, now now's your chance. You need to, um, yeah, okay, go. I think we lost a lot of what you said, Bob. You, I think you had some data congestion or something. I didn't hear you. Oh, just go ahead and speak. It's your, you've got the floor. <laughs> Are you talking to me? Bob? Yes, I am, David. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm David Davis. I've spent about uh, 30 years in uh, developing and researching semiconductors. We have a lot of plasma systems in that process of both development and in production. So many of the phenomenology that we're talking about now, we'd observed 30 years ago. And, wow. and we scratched our heads and went, this does not make any sense. Where's this carbon coming from? How in the world really? did it get contaminated with iron and silica? So wow. this is, uh, and, and my, some of the, my old boss, who was a chief technology officer where I work, 
have recently vis visited and compared notes and we're going we've we've seen this forever and yeah. just refuse to admit it and uh so it, it's been a wonderful the last 10 years you and i've kind of known each other uh, uh that uh to have a chance to look at all this stuff fresh and with new eyes and new ideas and so i feel very excited to be a part of this and bob i can't congratulate you enough for your efforts uh they're your efforts are just extraordinary and um it's, it's I, a, I really a look team, forward to it's the a next team effort year. I'm I'm just better at in front of the camera. Uh, maybe maybe not, but I try. There, there, there's it's only because people have shared, uh, and would be that a, a particular paper they might have thought was interesting, or a particular scientific announcement, or often more often than not a historical observation. And I know you um, have shared some historical observa observations that I passed forward, and it's those um, contextual. Uh, and relevant observations that in your case, as you said just now, you, you found um, were so unusual at the time, you just thought you'd made a mistake. But then to see them reappearing again, it was like, oh, I wasn't going mad. And yeah. the fact that you were able to share that helped me believe that what I was seeing wasn't just rubbish. And and if I, if it hadn't been that, I can honestly say, David, I, I should probably I should probably say we're I'm I'm actively involved in research. Uh, we've developed some new uh, as I, as you're aware, electro electro stimulated spectroscopy, which by the way we're having to rewrite our software so we can operate under Windows 10. We had it running under a 46, and our 46 computer died, and that <laughs> kind of forced us to. Uh, rewrite our software under Windows 10. But anyhow, yeah, so I've, I've got a lot of, we're, we have a lot of development work uh, and active uh, active work. I have my own plasma system. In fact, I have two. Um, and uh, we're investigating just like everybody else, trying to make, you know, sense of this in both a, a quantum, uh, in the quantum physics world and also a classical world. And there's some very interesting classical physics um a, a par a parts that actually fit this i mean this is really not magic or mystery there are a few pieces just a little bit mysterious but really as you've shown there's there's so much background on this that we can't we can't call this a real mystery there there's some physics issues uh that are a little bit different but we just need to investigate them and document them yeah i agree i agree so thank you very much uh david Okay, so who's next up? Uh, Gordon, please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Gordon here. Um, yeah, I live in uh, Wiltshire in uh, England. So only about uh, 20 miles from Stonehenge uh, and lots of crop circles here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in IT, uh, but I, I have a really big interest, a vested interest in making sure the lights stay on, obviously, because <laughs> my job depends on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no power, no IT. Uh, and I've just got a very big interest in this. I, ever since I was a kid in the, uh, the space mission uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, I remember watching that and thinking, wow, I want to be. Well, I kind of got into space in the end. <laughs> but then uh, for uh, many years now, I haven't been in there. I've been working in sort of general IT background for, for big data and stuff like that. But, but I, I've, 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 this whole subject area really fascinates me. Uh, and I always thought, like, uh, like looking up, and, and I mean, like they must have done years and years ago, thinking this is stupid about the way the the, the planets process and all the rest of it, and the, maybe, maybe the Earth isn't the center of the uh, universe. It, it, it's the same sort of curiosity and and the same sort of making things a bit simpler <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and making more sense of everything. Uh, I think you know we we have this wonderful opportunity here, all being alive, to actually make sense of what we see and and, and enjoy it, uh, it and share it. Uh, and, and this is why this inspires me so much what, what's been done here by everybody here because uh, really our, all our futures depend on this working out i mean it's game over if this doesn't work out so yeah i'm i'm, I'm keen on it <laughs> but as an enthusiast and an amateur yeah rather than uh, Listen, I don't have it, it's lab, absolutely right? fine i i came from a, a graphics design business there are all kinds of people in this field that uh, you know, even some of the uh, luminaries in the field, they, they have other jobs. 
because uh, let's face it, this hasn't been the best supported uh, field of scientific endeavor, let's put it that way, even considered a science for most of its history. And uh, so, you know, it's surprising. What we found uh, in the MFNP is that it's crowd contributions that have really been able to uh, pick out the nuggets from the universe of information in a way that, you know, it is, is not artificial intelligence, it's real intelligence. And it's surprising when you have a, someone that comes in who's a plumber, for instance, one of, the, one of our biggest fans is actually a plumber who's in his 70s in, in, the, in the US, and he's found some nuggets. And, you know, and it's, it's also people of uh, different ability as well. Uh, you know, if you take John Hutchison, um, he has uh, um, some conditions uh, that, that have uh, meant that he's had a different perspective on life. And it, that's sometimes what it takes to, to be able to deliver things that a, a, a so-called ordinary person may be incapable of ever doing with all the opportunity and education in the world. So um, uh, th this, is, it, this is all hands and all hands can, can make it light work. So yeah, so d don't put yourself down because th th my father always said that a volunteer is worth 10 men. And you know, if you are interested in the subject, you're, you're already well on to contributing to it. And, and uh, what I'm gonna share at the part of this presentation is, is an, an, another way that I think maybe we can help researchers uh, in the field um, uh, using a, a modern technology and just your voice to amplify the message is, is one thing because you probably visit forums that I would never visit uh, or maybe I would visit them, I don't know because I have a small bandwidth so I tend to focus in a few places. So, you know, it's, it's about spreading your skills. So thank you very much and just don't do yourself down, okay? <laughs> you're here and that, that is, you're a very small fraction of a very small fraction of a percent by being here. So thank you, Gordon. Okay, so um, Hank, you've joined us. Excellent, I'm, I'm glad you have because uh, I'm gonna share some images uh, from your uh, uh, work. So Hank, uh, please, you stop if you wish to, that's you okay. Just order. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me, everybody? Hi, Hank. Yes, we can. Um, yeah, where? Um, I, I, I just got inspired by the global BEM uh, presentations of the Sapphire project. And then uh, I just thought, well, studying it, studying it, I think, well, yeah, it's just a little electricity in a vacuum chamber and <clears throat> getting 14 times uh, more energy out of it. Well, this is the holy grail. I should pursue it. And so I went on in the, the shed and I started experimenting. That's it. Um, but then, uh, of course, it doesn't work. Of course, and you have to go on. And I, I contacted the Sapphire team and they said, yeah, sorry, uh, it's dangerous. Uh, we don't uh, share any information. I think, yeah, well, that's nice. And then I found uh, Bob and now I'm here. And um, I already heard it uh, being talked. Uh, I, I, when I look into my tank, I say, in my my reaction chamber or whatever you call it uh yeah you see um the universe or whatever you see it's it's magic it's really magic and you can only see it with your own eyes when you look through the window it's a different world um and the stupid thing is you can never reproduce it the sevar team says well it's very simple you take the new parameter the old parameters and you can reproduce it well, that's not true. Um, every time there is a new adventure. Um, and yes, many, many things are the same, but every time a little different. And I don't know why. So then that's the moment that you think, where is somebody sitting next to me and discussing what you see? And that's exactly what Bob says. Sometimes you see things, but you don't understand it or you don't recognize it or you think, now that cannot be true, or you think it's like welding sparks. But then Bob comes along and say, no, it's a wall of fire. And I think, well, what uh, 
going on in my tank. Uh, and then you start thinking and then you go further and further. But still, I don't have this 14 times energy production. And I told Bob lately, uh, it's, it seems that uh, I have sometimes the, the idea that maybe energy is disappearing. So then I have the opposite. That's not good for me because I want to have excess energy. So there is magic, magic going on and uh, I like to solve that. So I hope people, um, I hope to find people in the Netherlands that are um, just as crazy as I am because nobody understands what I'm doing. But uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that would be a help to be, I'm, I'm kind of lonely in the Netherlands. I'm, I'm kind of yeah lonely yeah you you need sometimes sometimes somebody to sit to next to you and um and find um maybe find a solution well hang so, uh, uh, it. It. Uh, have uh, announced that they're going to do an overnight bus uh, uh from my city to your city or very nearby your where you're living so hopefully Sorry, I, I, I didn't hear that uh, that exactly uh, the Red Jet, the kind of uh, Czech bus service, they, they're going to offer an, uh, an overnight service uh, to between your city, basically, and where I'm living. Um, oh, great. So yeah. it, it's, when, when travel is possible, um, it's going to be a lot easier to come and join with you. But I do know that there are people that are interested in this space that are living in um, Holland. And it would be great uh, for them to, uh, you know, work, work with you. And um, I, I said at the beginning of the presentation, I don't know whether you were in, but I'm going to, I'm going to propose something tonight, um, which uh, may be able to help uh, financially support your work. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, get, get the product of your work into a wider audience. So we're going to try that and, and everyone can play a role in, in making that better. So I'll, I'll come on to that later in the end. Um, so thank you very much. I have to say thank you to David and uh, Hank, because without you guys, um, uh, Your audio disappeared. And audio disappeared. I disappeared. Did I? John, did I disappear? You lost. You lost your audio, Bob. Oh, have I? Okay, let me see what's happened there. Can you hear me now? I've switched mics. Can you hear? Yeah, me I can now? hear you now. Yes, it was coming in and out. Okay, uh, all right. Breaking up. Okay. Um, sorry. Like I say, my my studio. Um, power was off so i had to think of something quick yeah, if, <laughs> hey bob if some of us if some of us will, will, will uh stop our video it might cut down on some of the data volume and it might help that a little bit so that's why i, I turned my video off and that should okay. that should give a little more uh, okay. audio bandwidth for the number of people you've got on here yeah okay so so thank you um i, I just wanted to give a special thank you to hank and david for um their contribution uh, over the last several months, uh, because Your audio is gone again, uh, Bob. Sorry. Um, uh, let me see if there's an issue with my connection. I don't want to switch connection.
Anyway, while Bob's working on that, is my audio better now? Hi, John. Okay, go go ahead, John. Can you hear me now? E yes. E yes. Okay, go ahead. I I'm recording locally, so whatever you said, you missed it. So go now yeah you're you're still coming in and out Bob. You're, you're still coming in and out Bob. okay i'll kill my my video john you, you you go now well uh i while you were working on that i just thought i might speak a little bit uh, i've been following uh leonard well i was aware of ponds and fleshman when that happened but uh uh didn't really get interested until rossi came onto the scene did some dabbling of my own, <clears throat> trying to duplicate Rossi's early uh, nickel hydrogen uh, system, and uh, got nowhere. Uh, just, just don't know enough. I, I don't have enough background in physics. Uh, it's uh, and I find a lot of this over my head. Uh, my background is electrical engineering. Um, uh, industrial automation, embedded controls, software, and uh, but I find this very interesting stuff, and I'd sure like to see the problem solved. Um, and if somebody in the area needs uh, some help with controls or something like that, I may be able to help. So I'm pretty much covered up with other duties too. Anyway, back to you, Bob. Okay, so uh, hopefully this works. So um, thank you very much, John. And also, hey, Bob, you to make sure to turn off your video. Make sure to turn off your video. Okay, all right. Is that better? Can you hear me audio? Works great, works great. Okay, great. Um, so, um, I have to thank John because at key points in the project's history, he supported it. Does that do we how do we kind of want to proceed i mean i, I bob if you need to re, reconnect your internet or something i mean is there a way we can sort of come back or okay um okay let let me let me uh, switch to wi-fi uh, bizarrely um uh, if 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 i go away then um, because i'm on a 400 megabit connection here so i don't know why um but uh, this is the first time i've done this on this connection so I will come off my wired connection. I'll go to my my uh, 5G wireless. So if I go away, I'll relaunch the room, and you'll just have to come back in if you can. Let's. We're all testing here, so this is the first time. So it. it yeah, th this is great. Anyway, thank you so much. Okay. okay. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna kill my wired connection, and I'll see if that kills it. Oh, that's interesting. It's still showing, but uh, yes. Uh, okay, so I I didn't drop out. Oh right, yeah. That's pretty neat. Okay, so um, no, I I have five Wi-Fi connections in this house and and one uh, fiber. So I don't know why it's having an issue. It might just be now I'm just on one Wi-Fi connection. I've killed the the wired connection. It might be that. So is everyone hearing me clearly now? Yeah, now you're really clear. I think it probably was too many uh, channels. All right. Yeah. 
And we can probably go back on video if everybody wants. I mean, I'm guessing, but that's, I don't want to break things. So, <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to switch video here because uh, I plug, unplug the hub. So, yeah, Bob, you're, you're a bit in the dark at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not a real me. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, epic fail. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do it. Um, oh dear. Bob warped into a hyperdimension. This, this is it. No, I'm in, I'm in a black hole. <laughs> He's in an Evo. Oh no, I know what's wrong. I've actually got the Logitech in front of the other one. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> now you see, now you don't. Okay, I'm an idiot. All right, okay. All right, the, the embarrassing moment is now over, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, where were we? Did, did Nick X uh, want to speak? Nick X, no. PLQ, did you want to speak? I'm gonna... Ask you to unmute. No. Slobber them. Slobber them. Do you want to say something? Okay. My mic is on. I don't know. Do you hear Perfect. me? Yeah. Perfect. Great. So, hello, every, everyone. So, my name is Slobodan Stankovic. I'm from Switzerland, in French part of Switzerland, uh, near Lausanne. But so, you're not really Swiss, are you? Uh, well, no. My parents are from Serbia. And I, I'm born actually in Switzerland, so Estava uh, like it's... Uh, you are Swiss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm Swiss with origin Serbian, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, what about me? Uh, well, that's maybe more, almost 15, 16 years now I've been uh, working, I could say, working with oxyhydrogen. And uh, it was... Uh, the beginning were with uh, uh, what, what is Stanley Mayer uh, with his electrolyzers, and uh, I was with my father, just like, uh, hey, let's do this, uh, let's try to replicate his, uh, you know, electrolyzer. We started with uh, with tubes, uh, stainless steel tubes, with the, try to re rebuild the same thing, but this didn't work like that. Uh, uh, we missed a lot of electronics, a lot of uh, knowledge about how did how he did this so uh, we switched to the standard electrolyzers and so we continue with that and it was um, uh, really funny to uh, build all these electrolyzer to uh, to try to uh, make them more efficient and so in the beginning i tried to to count number of bubbles coming out from the electrolyzer to see how much is it efficient <laughs> So it was, uh, yeah, funny stuff. And with the years, we uh, made the bigger and bigger electrolyzers and uh, tried to do things with them. And then the magic starts, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Hank, uh, it was uh, really interesting what we could obtain with these gas. And uh, uh, even after that, I tried to find some more information about it, uh, what what's going on exactly uh, and uh, it's come it came out to, to be some sort of French French science and you know nobody really uh, wanted to understand and nobody really wanted to knew more about that uh, they all everyone said oh it's just oxygen hydrogen and that's all and so but I don't know uh, as I said uh, Bob uh, a few days ago uh, I was convinced that it's not just only hydrogen and oxygen inside and must be something else because there was so weird things coming from, from this gas and the weird things that we can obtain with it. So I continued to work with it and uh, try to uh, build, you know, uh, everything by myself because uh, everything you want to, to measure, to, to, uh, to analyze, it, it's thousands and thousands of dollars, so you, you cannot do that. You know, you cannot afford all these, uh, you know, uh, apparatus. Uh, I don't know equipment to, to measure and so on. As I said on the in Italy conference, I said uh, thank you eBay for all, all these, <laughs> you know, stuff you can buy. So uh, 
so I buy it and by the way, I don't, maybe you can see a small part of my lab here right now. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, I'm continue to work with it. And uh, thanks to Bob and his uh, presentations. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, maybe we can do something more about this and try to uh, understand a little bit more what's going on. So that's it. So did you get a spectrum for me? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. But, but I have, I have uh, things ready for that. The problem was uh, the camera. I have one camera. Once again, uh, it's uh, like Microsoft webcam uh, studio and just once it starts, once it stops, I have to buy another one just in, to, to replace it. But I'm so sorry, but it, it is ready. It's over there in, in waiting for, for the... Uh, what for what the I asked Slobodan to do is to um, get some chalk. He, he he's, uh, has another day job where he should have been able to get some chalk. And he did acquire some by the end of the day. And could, uh, could he expose it uh, with some his HHO and take a spectrum? Uh, right. And I know he has a, some. Uh, you have a couple of spectrometers, don't you? I have two. Uh, uh, no, three uh, spectrum uh, spectrometer. Two ocean optics. One ocean view, two thousand small one. Another one is a uh, near infrared. Uh, I just uh, got it from the uh, uh, revision. Uh, when I bought it, it was a, a small range. It's uh, something like uh, forty hundred to fifteen hundred. Uh, nanometers a range and it's <laughs> just small range so i have to to make the modification to have the all the spectral range from 900 to uh, 1700 so well, uh, but, but before you change the range get a spectrum with its high resolution because there might be some data in there that could be important sorry before you change the range yeah get, get a spectrum with it with the high fidelity in that small range yeah, but it's in the infrared. I don't know what's what to measure inside. Of, now just, from just the, get the spectrum. You don't know whether it's going to be important or yeah. not. Yeah, but it's already done. I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you you could you you may well be surprised to see signals in there, and we certainly want to understand those signals. I've done some of that. I don't have the full spectrum that I want, but we're rapidly moving to that point. We can measure every. We're going to be within the next three months. We're going to be able to measure from UV all the way out to five microns in exactly. continuous coverage, and and I've been trying to put this together for two years, and I think we're finally to that point. And I expect to see a lot of very interesting, uh, what I call signals, mm -hmm. in that in that broad range. So I'm going to publish that as soon as I get as soon as I get all that data together. I'm excited. Yeah, what we're going to see. Fantastic, David. That's great, great. to hear because I do. I, I although I was talking about mazes the other other day, I, I am of the understanding that actually it's in the infrared that this thing occurs, um, and so um, this is why I'm saying it to you. So you. If you go and look at OH Maser astrological, and then look at the what the, what it's actually discussing about the frequencies that that actually occurs at, I think there's some interesting things to consider there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I have to say, Slobodan, um, it, it, I, the first time I met him, I didn't really meet him. I just saw his presentation. I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I videoed it and I put it on our channel. I didn't think anything more of it until I was invited to go to Japan. And it was only after I got back from Japan or, or during Japan, I remember I, I, going, I'm, I swear there was a guy at, 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 at ICC of 20. Uh, was it 20? Yeah, 20. In, 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 in Tohoku University uh, where it, that was doing the temperature of, uh, uh, you know, HHO, because we were observing 131.5 degrees and, you know, people were mocking that. I'm thinking, okay, well, that's what it said. <laughs> and so I went back to your, your presentation and you were finding that somewhere around that, uh, but using a very, very different method. So uh, that's fascinating in its own right. So. So thank you very much, Slobodan. And uh, I think probably some of the imagery you've captured, but also some Im imagery we can capture from future work will play into what I'm gonna talk about towards the end of this session. So um, I, I think let's, let's find a way where it's not gonna be a big problem for you to buy one webcam. <laughs> 
Yeah, you've lost your audio. You turned yourself off. Well, I, I I switched just my, my microphone, but I see someone here from uh, Japan. I see uh, Peter. <laughs> Hi, Peter. So you've joined the joined the room. Do, do you want to introduce yourself? Peter? <laughs> nice, to, nice to see you again. Hey, Slobodan. Good to Hi. see you, man. And uh, hey, hey, Bob. Hi, Peter. So I, I have, did I meet you in Japan or not? Yeah, yeah, I think we all went to eat at a bar. Me, Slobodan, <laughs> oh, yes, you, and, yes, uh, yes, yes. and some other people. And uh, is your, how's your friend, Slobodan? Is he good? Yeah. Uh, my friend, uh, I didn't talk to him. I, I uh, talk to you now. I think oh, okay. I talked okay. to him okay. two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. All right. Keep talking. Very interesting No, no, no. Peter, guys. introduce yeah. yourself because you've done some really oh, good great. work recently. So thank you very much for your work on Ultra. That's right. You oh, did... yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah so really I... Uh, I, I got uh, interested in um, Cold Fusion originally from, I think it was those uh, Peter Hagelstein lectures at MIT on YouTube. And uh, that was when I first realized it was probably real. And I, um, the more I, and I was, I originally came at all this stuff from Rife because I was most interested in Rife and uh, the plasma and the healing and the stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, my, uh, some people in my family are homeopaths. And I was interested in the water stuff. And I talked to uh, Slobodan about that at, at uh, ICCF 20 a bit. And I just, uh, all these different threads started coming together, especially in the last three years with Bob's videos. And it's just like a kind of like an epiphany. And it's just like, uh, where, where do you draw the line with what's possible with this stuff? And uh, yeah, I'm really curious to see what everyone comes up with. And I'm going to try to uh, do a few more experiments myself. But as you guys are always saying, it's a, uh, you never know how dangerous this stuff can actually be. So you, I want to be careful. And right now I'm doing everything in my family kitchen. So I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know if I want to keep doing it in the kitchen for, so maybe in a few months, I'll have a chance to do it somewhere else and maybe have a little mini lab like Slobodan has or something. So I look forward to that. Yeah. So hopefully I can step up and do a few more experiments then. That'll be fun. Well, it, it doesn't matter where you come into this, but you do find connections and, um, it's interesting, on the third day in, in January in 2015, we were with uh, uh, Francesco Piantelli. And he says, look, I want to do something different today. And he took us off uh, to this facility uh, nearby in Siena, uh, where he had this cancer treatment clinic. And it was using these huge magnetic structure things that he had built. And th there's like a, a big copper coil, and it was about as wide as my shoulders. Uh, a big sort of like an omega, not quite uh, uh, circular, but more like a, an ellipse. And uh, he had a flatbed one and, and, and about, I think, six or seven units. And it was absolutely full. Like, like there were people being treated in there. And it's been very successful. Um, and he uses, uh, actually, I think, I think there's something interesting about 50 hertz or, or around the frequency of, of mains. Um, but he's using magnetics and he would have a metal plate that he would put to focus the magnetic. So for instance, I had a bit of a back issue. I seem to be perpetual, um, but uh, he, he put this plate behind my back and I had a treatment and, you know, I don't know whether I felt any better because there's no other measure than I'm not feeling so much pain, is there? But for cancer sufferers, that uh, he, he would only treat terminal cancer sufferers where they'd basically been told that this is the end. Um, and, you know, they'd gone through chemotherapy that hadn't worked, they'd had incisions. So he, he, it was only at the end of the road that he would consider people. But uh, that evening he took us to his friend uh, who ran uh, this Fiorentina steak restaurant um, who had had breast cancer. And this guy had been saved after going through those last ditch efforts to save him and then gone to his treatment and, and basically thought Piantelli was a god. <laughs> And, and so it's interesting that such a significant figure in low energy nuclear reactions, having discovered the nickel hydrogen system, uh, and actually in a biological experiment, by the way, and, and the most significant thing about that biological experiment for me is that it happened around about four Kelvin and it was helium that he was putting in there. And it took me years to realize that that was probably coherent it, because you've got alpha particles and so on. And, and so it, it may have actually been the, the, the helium that was being cohered um uh, so i don't know but um that was his story but so uh, uh, even the other day 
I was talking about low, this pattern from way back when, and it turns out that the guy is, is into structured water. And if you go to the double helix water website, which I did just yesterday, there is a, a, a transmission electron microscope image of this crystal of water, which looks like a strange radiation track. And when you think about that, if, it, if you're making a crystal of water, which is exactly what Leclerc says is produced by cavitation in either laser cavitation or ultrasonic cavitation, and it's so incredibly dense and it flies out and it spirals as it comes out, then it's going to cut things if it's denser than most other material. And so this is absolutely fascinating. This guy Lowe, who, you know, 1966, he graduated uh, um, from the place where they made the first thermo pile, you know, and was part of the Manhattan Project. You know, it was not no one he was studying from and, and went on to, even in ICCF 23, there is a paper by Mastro Matteo and they're looking at, they, they have a thin film of um, either nickel or palladium, and it, it's, I think it's palladium, and it's, it's um, doped with deuterium. And then they're firing a laser at it. Well, you've got deuterium being evolved by the excitation of the laser. The laser, if you follow low, is cohering the deut deuterons and then smashing them back down into the deuterated palladium. It's exactly what he wrote in his patent. <laughs> and they're observing transmutation. So, it's just a much, much simpler way of doing it. So you've got to look at the phenomena and, 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 and is there a more simple way of doing it? And that's why what you've done with the ultra experiment in terms of really, really good work. So thank you. Um, one thing I've noticed just repeatedly from lots of different things is um, the number of people who come at HHO first or they come at nuclear physics and they go through HHO and then they end up at doing health stuff. And it just, it's fascinating to me because it, it almost seems like a, like a pattern where they, they know they aren't allowed to do something with the energy or with whatever. So then they move on to sort of like, oh, we'll, we'll make cars better. And then they try to do that. And then they kind of give up at that really quickly. And then they move on to the health stuff. And I just find it such an interesting pattern that they all do that because it's almost like the health stuff, no one really will ever try to stop them because they can't make any claims about it. So I just, yeah. I just... Well, I mean, Amaza has mineral water. Uh, I think I showed you that uh, during the Rugby World Cup, he has an energy drink, which was an official drink of the, the Rugby World Cup in, in, in uh, Japan. He has things for the Olympics, I believe. He has skincare products, a massive range of skincare products. There are many companies that use his equipment in health and beauty. Um, and, and so when you understand that if you vibrate water and you have an ability to create cavitation, that it produces all of the elements in the periodic table. And if you don't do it too aggressively, you don't end up creating the really nasty stuff. Then it is like water going down a stream or water squeezing itself through cavities under the ground as you know, water rained 100,000 years ago in the Malvern Mountains and it comes down out of a spring and, and it's much better than it went, went in what's happening to that water. So yeah, it, it is a pattern. And I do believe that there's something to do with the way that people, um, they, they can't find support for the energy side, which is why they got into it. But, but they, they have achieved something and they want to deliver something that does good. What I realized in 2017 is that this technology uh, is very, very, very good at destroying things really good and then nearly a year later I, I i i saw the paper by um ken shoulders that was saying look if you want to create heat you're just going to destroy whatever reactor you put it in but if you want to create electricity there's options to do doing that and so and and then john john hutchison told me once that the reason that he kind of gave up on his effect because he couldn't see any use for it all it did was made things fall apart <laughs> So, so you, would, would you like would you like for me to take a little bit of mystery out of some of this, Bob? Are you? Oh yeah, you, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So one of the things that we've discovered is that this is certainly about nano clusters, and and it's not. And, and I don't know if you know anything about nano clusters, uh, but these are very small atomic groups and clusters of atoms or molecules. 
And typically they span the range of just a few atoms to as many as 50 atoms. But the, the fewer the atoms that are, the fewer the molecules or atoms that you have, the more active it is. And the only ones that are active are the odd number of atoms. In other words, when you, it, so I have all kinds of different ways I can produce nanoclusters, but wet chemistry and gaseous and liquid and all, and, and even solid. And what happens is, is that about 47, a little less than 50% of any particular group of nanoclusters that you will produce will be an odd number of atoms or molecules. Um, I look at it more from an atomic standpoint instead of molecules, but I've certainly done some in wet chemistry with molecules and they behave very similarly. But you get two very distinct behaviors between uh, these even and odd number of, of, of nanoclusters. And if you run out and Google and you take a look at nanoclusters, nanoclusters have been around uh, since, certainly since the 90s. Um, and and they one of the most uh, common ways that they apply them is in catalysts, in creating new catalysts. And some of the advanced technology that we have for producing some of the most advanced catalysts today all come from uh, solid state nano uh, uh, clusters, nano catalysts. And they involve all the things that you would expect, nickel, platinum, palladium, you know, it, it's all there. Um, so it, that's a very important part of it. I, one other thing I'll mention real quick is if, if you know, if you'll allow, is that we're, we're, we're certainly seeing things that so I'll, let me point back to 30 years experience in finding carbon and silicon and iron in, in semiconductor process that are otherwise immaculately clean. We were driven uh, to keep the process pure and contaminant free. And I spent a, a great deal of my time going in investigating existing semiconductor production processes, typically involving plasma, and the number one contamination we, we ran into was carbon, okay? And I just drove myself crazy trying to find where this carbon was coming from. But I, what I can tell you is that what it really has helped me is to, is to all of that work that I did for 20 to 23 years consecutively was about preventing this, what we thought was contamination from happening. And a lot of the things that, that we did and that I did into trying to control this was actually inhibiting the, the, the nuclear transmutation. And so what I have done is to take that perspective and say, okay, everything that I did to prevent- Was the opposite of what you need to do. It, that it points in the direction of what you need to do yeah. to actually do that on a uh, larger scale. And I will tell you the, the, fundamental, the fundamental principle that you work from is the number of atoms that are involved in a particular process. Um, so we're, you know, we're making some pretty good headway and success and I'm, I'm real pleased with that. Uh, but it, that's what I would, I say, you know, this is not magic, okay? Mm -hmm. There may be just a little bit of mystery there, but this is understandable. This is understandable physics. It is definitely that, science, David. I don't know if you're aware of Piantelli's um, patterns, um, but uh, when he when we were with him in 2015, he says that this really works if you have nanoparticles between a certain size range. And if you go above that range, you won't get any effect whatsoever. Correct. Uh, yep. And he specifies the, the number. I mean, he didn't argue all the way down to say three particles. I think it needs to be a certain size. He argues that you need to get an, what he called an anharmonic oscillation. And I, I would suggest that, and, and there's a Russian or Ukrainian guy that calls it discrete breathers. And this is essentially, if you imagine our surface of water in our ultra experiments, you yep. get these extreme events, which are like super waves on the ocean. And this is an anharmonic oscillation. And in fact, if you have your, your particle um, small enough, then you have these edges, which are very convex. And then if you have an outlier, which might be your odd particle, because it doesn't quite fit within the matrix, that yeah, might so get I do out further than, than something else, which would fit his understanding and, and some other people's understanding. Oh, oh, well, so, you know, you remember the sprites, right? Yeah. 
Okay, well, so I've duplicated that experiment and and I'm you know saw basically the same thing that you guys saw. And what's happening is is that you're actually form, forming nano clusters in the gas phase, okay, which is above the surface of the water. You mm -hmm. got a lot of things happening uh, in because you have dissolved oxygen, no matter you know in the water and some other things are going on. But the more interesting stuff, it's what's happening above the surface of the water, and that's actually where you have water nano clusters forming. And and so th they're active. You, you just there, there's it takes several it takes a recipe. There's several things that have to go on, but if you really want to understand this, is to take a look at those gas phase molecules, and they're kind of little tricky things to deal with, but they're surprisingly safe, stable. Okay, once you get a nano cluster of water, which can be you know five to twenty. Uh, generally, my what it appears to me is that in the range of five to nine is probably a very good number that you want to see. Uh, but they are, they're very active and they're peculiarly unstable in under certain circumstances. So uh, the, the Ulta experiment is just absolutely fantastic. There's a lot, there is a lot more information there than I think anybody <laughs> yeah. has had a chance to realize yet. And, and often people, when they're doing their Ultra experiments, they say, I put clean water in, but now I'm seeing all these things floating around. And, and it's like, where do they come from? And, you know, I saw this on the original time I saw these effects in, in Suhaus Raukar's lab. And now I'm looking at Lowe's work and he's saying, we're creating these solid crystals of water. And it's like, well, if that in, in helix form, and you see these string things floating around in the water, maybe that's what he's creating. And well, the other you know, thing, it's, I'm so sorry, Bob. Now, I was just going to say, it seems to me in all these uh, Ulta experiments that everybody's been running tap water, and, and I immediately start looking at calcium. Calcium's playing mm -hmm. in this process, so I'll be quiet. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it may well be important. There is plenty of alphas in there, and we, we, we know that this can transmit matter, so it's, it's a good feedstock, because it's, it, but calcium is mostly uh, deck alpha, which is a bosonic nuclei. But anyway, so um, if, you, if you look at... Um, uh, Amaza, I think I shared a number of uh, moons ago. In Amaza's um, uh, analysis, I think it was at Tokyo University, or well, a university analyzed his water, they found that clusters uh, of, of um, uh, uh, water structures. And this was actually, I think, predicted by MIT. They said water should be able to form these like buckyball structures. And um, so one concept is, is that the atomic hydrogen that seems to be in there, which if, if you've got something in a tank for 13 years, you would expect the atomic hydrogen to not be there anymore. And it maybe it's trapped inside these bucket well, think, clusters. I think that's the nature of the, uh, of the nano cluster that actually the molecules breaking down and freeing the hydrogen in that process. That is how unstable these nano uh, clusters are, is they will decompose a molecule. So I'm convinced of that because we can see it in residual gas analysis and, and well, not have any hydrogen were doing in the process. Seeing the different mass weights of these clusters. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot more going on than first meets the eye in HHO and um, ultrasonics with water, really. It's, and, uh, and also, there's not just the surface of, of the free surface. You've got the free surface it's inside a bubble. <laughs> There's a boundary there, so you know there's 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 different all kinds of different domains, uh, um, and, and you've also got the space between the oscillation plate and stuff. There's there's several places where you've got a very different parameter space, and so yeah, there's there's lots to be learned, and probably most of it's already been done. We just haven't looked at the historical literature. <laughs> That's what I find all the time. Okay, so thank you, for, David. That was really helpful. Um, uh, have we got anyone in the room? Oh, we've got more people in the room now. So we have 18 people now. So thank you, David. Um, Steve, Steve Bannister, you want to say something? Good day, everyone. It's great, great seeing, meeting everyone. Uh, I, so I've been following Bob uh, since the beginning MFMP days. And finally, I think met him at ICCF 21 in Fort Collins hung out with him, ICCF 22, and um, I continually learn a lot from him and many others, but Bob is, is uh, 
as some unique talents here. Uh, I come at this space primarily from a different point of view than most of you, as I am an economist um, whose research, primary research, is on interaction between energy inputs and economic activity or output. And having done that for about a decade, it's very clear to me that, you know, there are huge implications, both of the systems that we have, the energy systems, mainly carbon-based or fossil-based energy systems we have today, and some of the issues that um, arise from that, um, and how we can solve that problem with clean energy coming from what it, wherever, although it looks like Bob is helping to narrow down the places where it actually comes from with, with his work on coherence. So that's very interesting to me. So that's my primary interest is in trying to figure out where, um, you know, what, what the effect is going to be on, on some global systems of interest from a social sciences standpoint. But I also have a physical side in the sense that I've followed physics for many years. So I have just an inherent interest in, in many of the things going on. And I should mention <laughs> that I'm in Salt Lake City and on the faculty at the University of Utah and walk by the Fleischmann and Pons lab on a routine basis. And I'm one of the few people on campus who pays attention to it, but I try to change that. I'm very interested in trying to get my university re-engaged in um, helping in this effort. And I haven't made a lot of progress. Uh, you know, people nod their heads. Well, most of them, the chemistry department hates me <laughs> still. <laughs> they were the ones most negatively impacted by, you know, the excommunication of Fleischmann and Pons. Um, but but I, I, I'll, I'll just not give up. It's way too important. And, uh, you know, it, sometimes progress goes slowly, but I hope to continue making progress. So I want to thank Bob and all of you for the contributions you make. You um, are contributing to a significant, significantly different future. And that's, uh, for me, that's an extremely, that's, you know, that's the thing I'm looking for. Thanks. Thank you very much for your kind words, Steve. And thank you much for all your support over the uh, last several years. Steve, I think probably with HHO and variants, uh, I think we need to do um, some studies on simpler and simpler and simpler generators with the same kind of uh, elements like carbon, indium, tungsten, and so forth. But um, uh, I, I think the instantaneous nature of um, Amaz's gas, I can only speak to that because that's the one I've experienced. I would like to have been able to test the brown gas generator, as I've said, um, that we have somewhere in the US. And if that had done the same, but I, I think with, with Brown's own work and his claims, matching Amaz's observations and David Davis saying, whatever I did with these systems, we were getting lots of carbon in there. And with the work of Slobodan Stankovic as well, with the same structures, <clears throat> I think we can safely say these all do the same thing. And if that's the case, you can get, you can make really simple devices to do HHO and run these tests. And it's a case of like, I know you don't want to see this, but you give me the indium. I haven't done a test on it to say that this is indium, or you give me the tungsten and you're satisfied that this is just tungsten with thorium in it or tungsten or whatever. Then watch me in your presence, expose it to a Mars gas. Do a residual gas analyzer on the gas, and then you go away without me touching it and go and have a look at that sample and see what you find. Because it's, I don't know why there wasn't more data from Yul Brown in terms of, he said that I'm getting mostly carbon, but he, I haven't seen any data other than his claims. And of course, back in the 1970s and 80s or whatever, there was a lot less ability. It's hard enough now to get access to decent analytics, even when you've got one right up the road, believe me, <laughs> it's hard enough. Even when you're willing to pay people, it's hard enough. Um, so I don't know what it was like in the 70s and 80s, but I, I, I can forgive him for not having that data. 
but um, Amaz has seen these, this data, we've seen it, I know Slobodan's seen it, I know Matsumoto's seen it, uh, da uh, David Davis has said he's seen it. So um, I, I think this does it, and it does it every time. And the shock for people, it was for me, it, when I looked <clears throat> at these samples in Alan's uh, SEM and EDS, and I'm looking at the same piece of tungsten, and down here it's just tungsten and thorium, and over here it's all of the elements that this technology produces every day of the week, and it's bursting out of the subsurface of the tungsten. It's coming out, and then the material that is in the filter, the material that is in the filter is the same spread of elements, and when you look at the Parkmore tables, you see those are the elements it should be synthesizing and calcium being the most likely. And it's, it's like, this is impossible to be a coincidence. And then Slobodan sees the same thing. And then we see, the point is, is Steve, I think there's a path here where the, the, the people that you're having to deal with, I can understand them because they, they don't see something that's repeatable. But as far as I can work out, uh, certainly, I can speak for a Mars gas. It's basically low energy nuclear reactions in a can. It's just you light it, you put it on your material, and as long as you're in the right zone on the flame, I think in certain zones of the flame, it's going to do nothing but warm it up. In other parts of the flame, it probably won't even do that. <laughs> but if you get it in the right zone, something very special happens. Something very special happens. And I have to thank Slobodan's. ICCF 22 presentation because the context of what he shared there and he was like that's what I see this is I looked at it and that's what I see and and people are saying well why don't we see anything else and it's like well that's what I see <laughs> and when you put it in context it makes sense Mondiani mm. was observing increased production of OH radicals why what why is that important and and so Steve, I think I think you've got a way. I, I, I would like to do more work. So Slobodan and I have got a plan to go to the States, if it's possible, with the Browns gas generator and do a test there. There are other people in this group that may may want to be involved with those tests, and they don't need to talk about that now. Um, what I will say is if that doesn't happen, I'd, all, I'd try and go to Switzerland and we'd run a whole bunch of tests and I'd get those over to Alan and, and we'll have a look at them because I, I think this is a slam dunk. Yes, I can see it's behind you. So, so we, we, we're going to make a date. We're going to make a date and whatever happens, we're going to have more, more robust spread data. And if people have got an idea, you know, if they want to run the tables or they want to think what happens when X, Y, and Z, uh, put some proposals together and and, and I'll work uh, with Robert if, if you do a certainly if you do a US road trip <laughs> reach out and um, we'll okay, figure Steve. something yeah. out. I mean I would it would give that, me just for, just for your interest uh, and uh, you know I, I lost track of this in the because I, everything is so busy but whatever it's not, it's not a great it's not not a good excuse um, at at ICCF 22, I spent quite a bit of time with Dave Nagel, and he was going to package up some experimental kits. And I said, well, Dave, I'll figure out a place on, and on campus to get one of those hosted, and you tell me what we need, what data we need to collect, and I'll, I'll try to figure out how to get that done. So I don't know, and I wrote to him a couple of times, but didn't hear back. So I, I'm going to, I see he's on the agenda for ICCF 23, so I'll use that as an opportunity to get reconnected with Dave on, on that particular aspect. But I'm fascinated if you end up doing a road trip, because um, I think showing people <laughs> makes all the difference in the world. All well, the difference. It, it, may, it may do, and then it may not. Um, <laughs> you, because I, I think John said the only way people would believe his technology in New York is if he put it on the back of a low loader and drove around and said, what do you want to see? Levitation, destruction of material? And, <laughs> and, and we had a whole discussion about this. And he said, even if you showed them real time at their request with the samples they brought along, they'd still think it was magic. They'd still think you'd done a trick because yeah. their brain well, says it's not possible. I... So I've, I've got a good and growing network. Let me just say that at Utah, way beyond my department. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, I, I, it's, it's worth a try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think HHO, um, Browns Gas, the Mars Gas, 
you know, yeah. oxyhydrogen yeah. gas. I think this is so trivial. And if you go to Rex Research at the top of the thing, it says all the, it, it does the same thing as what Hutchison's technology is doing. I think I, I demonstrated yeah. that with the indium. The fact that you have a metal that should be a liquid at 156.6 degrees C, and it's neither liquid nor solid. It turns into like a rubber sheet. It's, com it's gone to a different phase somewhere between the two. Um, and you kind of see this with other metals, but the transition is so quick. It's just so weird the way it happens with indium. And so um, if it is that in a can, then Hutchison has already yep. proven that he can remediate waste. He can remediate um, and yep. lower the activity of materials. Um, and so the, the, the two things marry up and um, if it destroys matter, when I say destroys matter, it goes into, it, it takes whatever you've given it and it puts it into a package and it kind of, it rolls the dice and depending on the pressure or depressure in, in, in what it's packaging it into, you get a spread of elements coming out. Mm. And what it always tends to do is if you've got light elements and heavy elements, it puts things into the middle, but towards the, the biological and rock forming elements, which you only need to look at the crust of the earth to know what it's what trying to target because you've got four and a half billion years of cavitation tectonic plate friction sparks and and lightning bolts and it, everything is going on and you know you've heard me argue this before so um i think amar's gas is is literally or brown's gas or hho is the shortcut and if it does mess up nuclei and end up with stable nuclei then give me all the radioactive stuff you want to get rid of. That's what I'm interested in. Because so, so packaging up like a lab experiment hmm. to demonstrate this and letting me or somebody find, you know, some young unbiased researchers or, you know, instructors or whatever in either physics or chem. You could ruin their lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're pretty savvy. I'm not, I, I don't okay. think I need to protect them. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have I, people I introduce this stuff to, I have a conversation with ahead of time, you know, basically, do you really want to hear this? <laughs> Let me tell you what, what can happen. Uh, but there are, there are some, you know, my, uh, you know, Fleischmann and Ponds are 30 years gone, 30 plus years gone now. And um, from the campus and um, from most memories. So the pain is certainly faded, except for the chemistry department. Um, but those guys are all retiring. Well, I mean, when, when you look at what they're doing is, if you look at their, their uh, 1cc um, uh, singularity. The Fleischmann of Ponds. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. They, they, it was, I think in 19, I, I may be wrong, but I think it was in 1987. It was a couple of years before yep. their announcement. Yep. Yep. And they had one cc of palladium and they're loading it with electrostatic pressure for three weeks yep. and nothing yep. seems to be happening. And they, they yep. asked one of their sons, I believe it was, or, or relative to yep. go in and just turn down the voltage. Yeah, and, Sam Pons did right, over a weekend. Right, okay. And then they came in on the Monday morning and there was fine particulates all around the room. The, the apparatus had basically <laughs> come apart. There was a hole in the fume covered base and it went into and vaporized some of the concrete right in the basement they were in a basement lab yeah yeah so it, and I've, I've i have tried a couple of times and failed so far at getting someone to show me the lab to see if the hole is still there <laughs> well that's but interesting I, yeah <laughs> But I'm not giving up. I mean, occasionally, you know what, I just like dress up as a janitor or like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, well, there's a, a guy, or something. There's a guy that actually took a, a course, a statistics class from me of all things, who works in the um, uh, maintenance in the iron, in the, you know, in the chemistry building. And I've approached him and never digged it very far. But you know, you guys get me ginned up, and I'll I'll, I'll keep going after it. So <laughs> a bottle of gin's on its way to you tonight. <laughs> Bob, can I, I say mean, something? if I can just get a picture of that, it'll be world famous, right? <laughs> yeah, we don't go in that room, David. Please go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, so I, I think you know you know me well enough to know that I'm I've been pursuing the neutrino route 
and and I'm absolutely convinced that Omasa gas is producing neutrinos, and of course that has some pretty significant implications. Uh, you, I know you have a path that you're pursuing for a neutrino detector. I'm pursuing another path, um, and and I'll go ahead and mention it. I'm I'm working on two D two dimensional semiconductor materials. Um, there's some very strong evidence that they are sufficiently sensitive uh, that we should see some signals. And as I've mentioned before, that it 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 from a theoretical standpoint, it seems pretty obvious to me that the uh, De Bruyne wavelength is a big player. And this goes back to Parkamoff. I mean, I'm, he's kind of my hero because that's what really got me started on pursuing the, uh, the neutrinos. But I'm absolutely convinced that the phenomenology that we're seeing is directly associated yeah. with the neutrinos. Yeah. And yeah. because all that phenomenology that we saw from the anomalous melting temperatures and all of that can be explained by the neutrinos, but they would not, they're not solar neutri neutrinos. These are between, these are non relativistic neutrinos. And so I don't know when we're going to get our, get our, you know, neutrino detector, you know, fully online. And I'm not going to be satisfied until we have neutrino spectrometer that characterizes what wavelengths that we're looking at. Because well, he specifies the wavelengths that he was studying because he used diffraction yeah, grating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, all yeah, the no, of data is in space Earth human. Yeah, but there's this huge, there's this huge. Uh, well, it goes uh, either yeah. side. It goes either side. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, well, it's not just so, the ones he was looking at. <laughs> yeah, so, but no, I, listen, I have great, tremendous respect and admir admiration for Alexander Parkamoff and the work that he did and ten, dedicated more than 10 years of his life. Um, but, you know, when you really look at it from a conventional physics standpoint, astrophysics and all of that, and you look at all the, the neutrino detectors have this tremendous gap mm -hmm. in sensitivity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it seems like all of this stuff is happening in this gap that we don't have detectors for. And, and, and that's where, that's it. I, I, my you, may, you may understand this already. That, uh, and I was talking about this to Hank earlier this week. He's saying, I don't know yeah. where the energy is going. I said it could just be leaving as ghost particles, like it just leaving the cell. It could be leaving as neutrinos or neutrino condensates. If you create a detector, you're close to creating an energy harvester from this, by the way. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. But <laughs> and I'm sure that's not lost on you. And But the, the, the reason I see, I see this condensing material and as it condenses it's like pumping air into a tire like i was doing with my child's <laughs> bike today as you pump yeah. air in it's pv equals nrt the temperature goes up because it's getting into a denser space well if you have two electrons colliding we already know from i thought parkamov had it but i didn't realize that um it was already discussed in 1957 <laughs> you know and, until recently the, the fact that you have two electrons, if they hit it, 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 you have an electron and a neutrino, they can share energy, but electrons colliding at a sufficient density can synthesize neutrinos and they can be in this cold domain. And so if the, if the condensing plasmoids or the condensing exotic vacuum objects are having to shed energy in order to condense, just like plasma does to ga gas, does to liquid, does to solid, when it's going to this super solid, if it's going down to this other phase of matter, let's call it an EVO, then those electrons and the other nucleons are having to bash together and get rid of that energy. And well, you know what? It's in that wheel of paper in 1957. It, it, yeah, I need to go back. I need to go back and take a look at that paper. But I'll, I'll tell you my, my, my vantage point or viewpoint on it is that neutrinos are essentially neutral particles. They have no problem whatsoever in penetrating the nucleus of any atom, and 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 I'm convinced that the these lower wavelength neutrinos basically get into the nucleus and fundamentally get stuck, and they mm -hmm. disrupt. They are influencing the nuclear strong force, mm -hmm. and that nuclear strong force is affecting that nuclear strong force is affecting the electron orbitals, and that's why you see this anomalous melting behavior in these metals is because you fundamentally you've 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 you, you kind of jacked around with the nucleus and it's affected the electron shells the electron shells have re 
have restructured, and that's directly how the the these phase changes work, uh, where metal will melt. And and this is dramatic. You know this, Bob. I yeah. mean, you know. It, it's I've seen really that. dramatic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In yeah. several different technologies. I, I'm going to give something here. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about something that I, I deliberately lowered the price of, of the Parker Mod book last year in order to, so that more people could get it. Um, because there's something in there that, that I'm going to talk about later in, in next week, um, which is it'll be a small presentation. But when you see it in the context of everything I've said over the last couple of months, it's just going to be, oh, well, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, that's, well, that's a tip for, for for you for you there. So oh, oh listen, uh, listen, I, I love it. It's uh, I, I think there's a lot more going on, and and these neutrinos are a very important part of it. But at the quantum scale, where you're talking about the atoms and a few atoms that are interacting with each other, uh, there there is there is a lot more going on, and and certainly one of those things that I'm most fascinated about right now is this bulk material behavior. And you might call it an effective heat zone. Well, it's not. It's not. A, it's an effective heat zone, but it ain't heat. Okay. No, no, no. It, it, right. it, 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 the I've always likened it to the electrons losing their ability to hold on to each other, or or, or rather to the adjacent uh, lattice me metal well, lattice. It, uh, so these are subshells. These are not valence shells. These right. are all subshells that are getting rearranged. Do you, so. do you think the valence shells are interacting with 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 the um, your lattice electrons? Oh, it's entirely possible. Um, so, but generally when you talk about semiconductors, we're always talking about the, uh, uh, these subshells and yeah. the band gap, the band gap in these subshells. Um, and so you get some real interesting behaviors uh, in semiconductors anyhow, the idea that you have pole flows, which is nothing more than a depleted region of electrons. You know, we've kind of yeah. touched on that, I think, in the past. Yeah. So, um, so what 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 so, Kankamov did for me was to remove this inability to think of a, a neutrinos uh, as anything other than um, extremely weakly interacting relativistic particles, and right. he also showed me that um, they can be synthesized. And it, what, this wasn't what he showed me, but I learned by following this that electrons can share their energy with neutrinos and neutrinos can share their energy with electrons. But if the they transfer, goes, yeah. Yeah, without changing each other, they're, they're still the particle they are, but, but they can share the energy. Yep. So you have a means to go from a black to a white Evo and back to a black Evo. The observed behavior that you can create because you can excite them to move to the other and back. I struggle a little bit with that, but I just need to do more experiments. <laughs> but but I, conceptually, I understood it, but then I see it with it, essentially what Wheeler is saying. And I'm no, no one like Wheeler. I mean, Wheeler is just like, he invented the term black hole and wormhole. I mean, this guy is no idiot. <laughs> you know, Feynman, I think, was his student <laughs> or something like that. He's, this, he worked on the Manhattan Project, Project and the H-bomb. I mean, it's like this guy is, you know, so he, he's, he's seen the inside of this story uh, from the beginning. Um, well, the only point that I was making about the neutrinos was is that when you're talking about producing millions, if not billions of neutrinos, it depends upon how many atoms are involved and what kind of reactions are going on. Uh, I liken it to having a sack full of rocks and you're putting sand in there, but you're shooting the sand in there. And then basically what happens when you get, when you, so the, 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 the strong force is only 144 times stronger than the uh, electromagnetic. Okay. So you, you get, you create enough particles inside that nucleus the nucleus comes apart and it basically um, ruptures from internal pressure because yeah. it overcomes the strong force. And, and, I, and I, I, I believe that's that, what it is. That would fit with, for instance, tungsten is a very long, stable element. I mean, it's not all stable, not all isotopes, but um, it, it, if you are getting into that nucleus when it just wants to fall apart anyway, it's just the oh, it's, yeah, look how happen. many neutrons, look how many neutrons are in tungsten, my God. Yeah. And, but it has this threshold with all these, when you interact, we've seen it with the nickel, we've seen it with the tungsten, we've seen it with the indium, that there, there is a point at which it, 
that it's literally a phase change and it immediately the whole thing yes. happens. Um, yeah. And this is exactly how Brown was saying you get the aluminium, the iron, and the americium 241, or the cobalt 60, or whatever it is you want to get rid of. You put the, the, the Brown's gas on and it, it starts to glow, it starts to glow, it gets brighter, it gets brighter, it brights or brighter, boom. The whole lot is gone. And it, it's literally like the thing happens in an instant. Yeah, and that's a little bit scary for traditional uh, nuclear physicists. Uh, there are some phenomena that resemble that, and it's uh, some pretty scary stuff. But if you don't see a gamma burst, you know, then it, you know, it's a different phenomenon. That's just kind of the bottom line. And and I believe that the the entire thing is encapsulated with coherent matter. It's like living inside one electron. <laughs> and and if anything comes out. It's like the light ray is trying to go into something which is literally a force field. It can't penetrate it and the energy is dissipated through the whole thing. And you get what Slobodan and Stankovic observed, which is this broad band going into the infrared. All of the photons from everything get I'm sorry, who was that? So, who was Slobodan, that? you can speak, do you want to speak to that, Slobodan? Oh, oh yes, uh, you, we and I, we and we've kind of connected in some oh, chats and what have yeah. you. I, and I really need to get better connected to you because some of the data that you've got is particularly intriguing to me. So, Slobodan, for the rest of the group, do you want to just um, no just problem. So, um, I've I've made this experiment with the uh, uh, with the um, what was the uh, the, the graphite, uh, which I presented at ICCF twenty two, and uh, well, nothing. <laughs> As uh, Bob said, it, it was a really, uh, really simple experiment. So I put uh, the graphene under the HHO plasma, uh, and uh, I tried to take some measurement, uh, spectral measurement, with my uh, uh, few spectrometers, uh, and I took all the residues from from the, the graphite, take the uh, all these uh, stuff to to analyze uh, in the university near uh, 10 minutes from, from my house. And they they measured uh, all the things that, uh, that are presented. So uh, uh, the thing is that a lot of, uh, I have a lot of these uh, small spheres all around the, uh, the site of the, um, of the, uh, the uh, plasma was hit the, the, the graphite and all these spheres were uh, I don't know, uh, 10 to 20 microns diameter. And uh, the inside was uh, silicon, what else? Aluminium, uh, uh, calcium, uh, all seven or eight um, elements that we can find every, every time, every time. Do you, do you have any of that material? Sorry, the raw material. Do you have any of that uh, uh, carbonaceous, carbonaceous uh, carbon spherical material? Oh, uh, I think I still have it here. One of the uh, uh, the samples I I, met, uh, I made the, the analysis. Uh, yeah. Of did, did you do Did you do any Raman Raman spectroscopy on it? Uh, on the small sphere, they were too small because they were not really equipped with the uh, Raman spectrometer. But I have some other um, samples that were looking like uh, crystals. And uh, they um, they could do some sort of uh, analyze that, and it was some something like calcium uh, CaCO2. Uh, so we're, we're finding we're finding diamond is reason I'm, reason I, if you if you look at it under Raman, you'll be able to see that it's a what what type of uh, structure it is. Yeah, and we're finding we're finding diamond. So yeah, uh, we we found this also a sort of sort of diamonds, uh, if we, we should say that, uh, uh, with the external structure, with, uh, with a lot of hexagons on the surface. Uh, I have a few of them. It, as I said in the, the presentation, it, it, to me, it was uh, really like uh, one of the elements found in the uh, meteorite, and which was uh, considered ID uh, carbon diamond, something like that. Uh, can so I, can I jump in? Carbon, yeah. Last, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, right. Can jump in because um, yes, you're observing diamond, but the interesting thing is you're observing lead diamond. And, yeah. and so, oh, well, that looks that looks like doped. That looks like doped diamond, Bob. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and the interesting thing is you haven't got 
or rather you're not trying to create the pressure that you would normally want to create to create those with and so exactly. something is creating the pressure and for me it's these this coherent layer this double layer it, it's the, there's a intense pressure there and if, if the whole structure is collapsing, then you can get something else going. There were, the first time we saw diamond was in 2013 on Chilani wires. Why is the diamonds growing on Chilani wires? That's one. Then in, um, this was observed obviously by Leclerc in cavitation many, many years ago. He was seeing diamond films. Um, and I, if you think he's got cavitation, well, you know, you're going to get HHO forming in the cavitation. <laughs> you're, well, um, you're, you're producing nano clusters. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and, the, not, the, and, and to just a real small step extension from that is their instability, and that instability is where all of these, where that's where all of this. Uh, so you would see, so we can say Evo, okay, or mm -hmm. plasmoid or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, it's uh, it it stimulates that. And, and so there's some real mechanisms behind what will bring that together. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where the magic happens. And you, but it's you, the uh, nano clusters that, that, produce that, that produce that effect because of their instability. And I guess you get some electron uh, C on those nano clusters and you get photon sure. interactions with those as well. And so you get sure. Interesting things going on on the surface there, and you get downshifting of light and all kinds of things going on. So um, we got a few more people that come into the room. One, Go on. One, one thing, just if I can. Um, I was uh, looking for the abstract uh, just uh, before the conference uh, of the ICCF 33, and uh, one of the presentation with, with uh, someone from India. He, was talk, he will talk about uh, uh, nuclear transmutation is better with the alloy metals than the pure metals. And uh, one of the things that was mentioned in the presentation, ISIS 22, is the uh, because I did this experiment with the carbon road because it's not 100% pure, but it's 99.8 something. And the 0.2% were a lot of, I, don't, I think there was uh, 30 elements inside of course a very small percentage uh, in the in the mass uh, percentage and the thing what i said is that this small uh, impurity could be uh, the trigger to to get a lot of elements other elements which are uh, in combination with the, the carbon could bring all the, the rest uh, of the elements we find in the uh, analysis. I said so, something similar, uh, Slobodan, in 2016 in ASTI, that um, when, when you look at the electronuclear collapse process in, in um, Sviadomenko, he's saying that in, in this electronucleus macrocluster, as he calls it, where the, the, the elements are denatured, you, you get occasionally, I mean, these are all in femtoseconds, but <laughs> if you had a timeline in femtoseconds, occasionally you get a stable nuclear form which, get, which gets ejected. And then in my mind, I call that Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. And when the, the material wants to denature, it finds a bit over here, which is, which is gold, a bit over here that's, that's silicon, a bit over here that's carbon. And it then builds like a crystal from that as a template. It's like a template. And so if you look at his, and we observe this with the electric, uh, electric plasma flow discharge experiments with, with um, um, Suhas Raukar, um, you, you have a whole chunk of palladium, which is round the, the vortex of, of the discharge or a bit of gold. And it's like, or, or a, 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 a slug of pure silver. And it's like, what happened when that, that denatured matter, uh, protomatter, this, this um, uh, prima materia, contacts a single crystal, uh, sorry, a single atom, or maybe it's a nanocrystal, as David is saying, um, it, it sees that, it grows off from that as its template. And, and it's, 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 it's just a guide. And so I think, I think there has been some research about you only get cold fusion happening when you get impurities. In fact, there's a lot of work done at ENEA on that, the fact that Hans and Fleischmann's 
had an impure electrodes, but they didn't know. And when they changed the processing, they didn't have the impurities in, so they didn't work. And also people trying to replicate them thought, well, oh, I've got to have the most pure thing in the known universe before I can get it to work. And so they all went to try and use pure material. But that, that was, it was important to have at least two elements in there so that you have some spillover catalyst process maybe going on yeah. or some gaps in there or electron, which David could probably well, speak more. So one of the th one of the things I would tell you is that in uh, in any material that crystallizes, you have a nucleation event, and there's several ways that can occur. Uh, but basically, what happens when you grow a crystal, it well, even if you have other material in there, that crystal structure wants its own like material, whatever that structure is. Um, so if you had let's assume let's say you had a gaseous state and you had this mixture of elements and you nucleated a crystal structure, which silica loves to be a crystal, okay? Whether it's amorphous or fully crystalline structure, uh, it will grow because all of the silica will be attracted to and react to the silica structure of, the, of that crystal form. And, and it, will, it will grow. Diamond is the same way, um, but it can incorporate other materials. So, so I, I'm just telling you that's that's kind of the nature of crystal growth. It has to nucleate so that you get the crystal structure started. Absolutely. But once it's started, it's going to continue. Absolutely. What I'm arguing though is that you you have these monoatoms, and they are the template for material that isn't that material to start with. It's kind of like the the atom and the proton matter is coming towards that atom and it, it becomes what it needs to be to crystallize onto that thing. Oh, I, listen, Bob, absolutely. In, in uh, zeolites and some other materials where we actually synthesize these structures, we, can, we have what's called a host, uh, host nucleation, which means that you have another atom or another molecule, typically it's a transition metal, oddly enough, mm -hmm. um, that will nucleate other material. So mm -hmm. those are those are all known phenomenon in uh, crystal growth. So yeah. what you're saying is perfectly rational. But I'm, I mean, I'm projecting. We're talking I'm projecting, fairly conventional physics. But I'm projecting it forward from rather than having a lot of the same material in another phase or in a lower concentration and preferring to crystallize on the the seed. I'm, I'm talking about material that has no identity. It's kind of like the, the Big Bang. It, it, the Big Bang happened and it didn't instantaneously produce all of the elements in the, well, that's what we're told, but I believe that, that out of that protomatter, other material condensed into solid matter. And then some of the protomatter became based on the template of the, the original elements that were formed. So anyway, I, I, I kind of need to, um, uh, we've got 15 minutes. And oh, let me be quiet, but it, you're, you're quite on track to phenomenon. Right. And I, I, I'm just, if you go and read, it's, it's an expensive read and it's a very long read. Um, uh, and I have only read probably about 10% of it at most. Um, uh, S.E. Adamenko's uh, book. This is kind of where he's going, where the, the material, loses it's it's not any atom and when you look at what matsumoto said he's basically saying it, it, it in electron nuclear collapse shoulders called it a quark soup it, it's no atom <laughs> it's just a matter it's it's a solid lump of not a solid lump it's it's a potential matter <laughs> it, and and then it becomes a, I, I, I love i love quark soup okay i'm i'm all into that <laughs> <laughs> okay is there anyone else? I, I see we've got Tim in the room, uh, Peter S., uh, John Whale. Does anyone else want to step in before I kind of um, talk to about two presentations in ICF 23? And I want to share something where we may, as, as, a, as a community, find a new way to uh, support researchers. So Peter S., do you want to, do you want to come in? Oh, hey, guys. <clears throat> yeah. Um... I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure why you're asking me what, what about support, but uh, <laughs> I, I thought you were new into the room. No, I've already had you. So goodbye. Yeah, yeah you've already had me. Yep. 
Alan, Alan, it's great to have you in the room. Did you catch any of the discussion? Alan Goldwater. Alan, are you there? Okay, so Alan Goldwater is an MFMP director. He's a colleague, a fantastic guy. And I just want to say thank you again to uh, uh, him for taking the plunge and getting the SEM and EDS because it meant so much to where the project has been able to go in the last couple of years. So, um, Tim, did you want to say something? Alan answered in chat, Bob. Oh, he did. Good, good. Hi, Bob. Hi. T Tim uh, from Utah. Hi, Tim. Just a long time uh, admirer and follower. Um, great to see you. Uh, great to see the work you do. I'm really appreciative of it. Um, I know the other gentleman was on here from Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, I, I actually am from BYU, Brigham Young University. And I knew uh, Steve, uh, Stephen, Stephen Jones. Yeah. So, yes. uh, in, interestingly enough. So anyway, anyways, I just wanted to say hi. Thanks for all your work um, and uh, continue the good fight. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim, for your kind words. Right. OK, so uh, anyone else, if you put up your hand, you, there's a thing where down the bottom you can do a reaction and you can put up your hand, raise hand. So if anyone wants to talk before I close this out, put, raise your hand and there's just two things that I want to talk about. A couple of presentations at ICCF 23 and then this potentially new way that we can support researchers in the field. So John Whale, did you want to say something? Uh, hello Bob um, and everybody else. Um, I thought it was a bit rude of me to have been lurking here and listening to everything this evening and not, uh, and not show my face. I'm actually sat here in my workshop. I'm based in the UK. Um, I'm actually uh, with one of the research teams at Warwick University um, where we study um, energy storage systems. Um, so I've got a strong interest in that side of things. And uh, I've, I've just got to say, um, I'm really appreciating the work you're doing. It's been fascinating listening to what you've been doing. I've been watching your YouTube videos and I thought I'd, uh, I couldn't miss an opportunity to drop in, say hello, and actually speak to the people in the community. This is fantastic. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks very much. I'll, I'll drop back into the background most of the time, but um, I'd like you to know that I'm, I'm back here, I'm supporting you. <laughs> Fantastic, John. And, and the thing is, um, to everyone out there, I can tell you I got things extremely wrong during this journey since 2012. And it doesn't matter. The point is, is you need to see and keep going and think and critically think and beg people to challenge you and research whatever you can with whatever time you have, because the truth will out. It, so, sooner or later, things can't be possible because everything, you have to have a system. So if you observe the same transmutations from four Kelvin in, in Pientelli to millions of degrees and from plasma and gas and solid and liquid phase, there's got to be something that's common between all those phases. Even if it's a subphase within the process, as, as, as David is arguing, you're creating something within that to create the outcome. But um, uh, I, I, I have been very wrong. And you can see how wrong I've been because each thing has been recorded. <laughs> and, but the point is, I couldn't, I couldn't run before I could walk and I couldn't walk before I could crawl. And before that, I was nobody, and I'm probably still nobody. So, um, but don't underestimate your ability to discover something or to realize something. And don't underestimate the fact that if you think you've discovered something or realized something, you probably haven't. It's probably been done before. And so when you think you've discovered something, go and see if someone else has thought of it first. And patents and papers, you know, hopefully Sci-Hub can stay up there. It's been a fantastic boon over the last several years to understand concepts where you don't have access to a university, which you're in a, probably in a position where you can, John. Um, you, you can go and use your university's resources to look at papers. I hope Sci-Hub still is available because it's a great way for sharing uh, um, papers so that the general public can, can start learning. Because I believe if you've got a sound mind and you are willing, you can learn this stuff and you can provide something, something of, of, of input. So thank you very much for your kind words. And uh, yeah, 
experiment. <laughs> Maybe I'll see you when I'm in the UK. That'd be great. And 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 to all those others in the UK, if you want to reach out, I'm going to be doing a, a bit of a tour around in in um, probably July, um, in, assuming they let me out of quarantine. Um, <laughs> so let me know where you are, and I'll see if we can. Maybe I'll, I'll have a couple of meetups in a couple of places in the UK and people can come and, and we just have a chin wag and a beer, a, a fine ale. <laughs> Let's put it like that. <laughs> so thanks, John. Okay, so I'm now going to, um, is, is there anyone else that wants to put their hand up and speak before I just talk about these two papers? Okay, all right. So the, the first paper is a paper by Klimov. It's an extension of the plasma erosion uh, uh, experiments. You, you can go and see it. And it I, I can't share you the video now because I can't do that. Otherwise, they might kick me out of the conference and I'm on there. So I can't share you the videos. Um, but essentially, he, he's using microwaves to ionize, uh, to excite uh, argon. And he's then using a capacitor discharge through a spark gap to, pr to produce a, a pulse of this plasma through a capillary tube. And in one, uh, capillary tube is made of PMMA, and another one is made of what he calls um, um, CF4, but it's actually C2F4, i.e. Uh, te te uh, PTFE. He observes that um, with the, the C2F4, the uh, polytetrafluoroethylene, the, the Teflon, um, when he's firing this ejection, to a copper plate and a nickel plate, I think it is, um, he, he doesn't see uh, uh, um, the material go through uh, the plate and there's no transmutation. With um, PMMA, which includes hydrogen, when, the, when it goes through, the, when the plasma goes through the tube, um, and as I've described, that would force the plasma to do poroidal and toroidal rotation. So it was forcing it to form an EVO structure, a soliton. And in fact, in, in his images, he shows a soliton. It, I, this will come towards propulsion. But anyway, you see something coming out the other side, which, which tells you this is a soliton. Um, he creates a, a large hole. Now, he calculates that he gets a COP by the amount of material vaporized and the energy they put in as something like, I think, three to five or something. I disagree because I think that, that it's actually causing a phase change in, in the metal. It becomes less strong and the, the, the pulse is the same, potentially not enough to account for the 3.5 3 to five times COP. The interesting thing is he sees th this large amount of material removed, he says vaporized, and he sees transmutation on there. I'll be interested to see what the transmutation is on the actual presentation. I could probably predict it. Um, but he says that, of course, the PMMA contains hydrogen, whereas the uh, PTFE, which is just carbon and fluorine, does not contain hydrogen. He therefore says that the hydrogen is the important additional element. This is great except he is not recognizing that it also has oxygen. And as we know, <laughs> if we create a plasma from oxygen and hydrogen, you're gonna get some OH forming and you're gonna get some H2O forming. So it may be the same thing that we've been observing. So I, I, I think that needs to be um, looked at, but in terms of an experiment, which is relatively simple, where you are removing hydrogen and oxygen, and not seeing the effect, I think it's a very, very important one. Uh, whether or not there's excess heat there, but there is transmutation. This separates something that is using the same energy input, the same amount of dis to create the, the argon plasma, the same amount of electrical discharge, going through the same size, size of capillary tube, going to the same target. And in one case where you don't have hydrogen and you don't have oxygen, you don't see this damage and you don't see the transmutation. And in the other one, you do. I think it's a very, very important experiment. The second presentation is by one Graham Hubler. Now, Graham Hubler worked at the Naval Research Laboratory. And in 2000, when the Abraham Dennis, uh, is, uh, 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 Israeli concept of how um, uh, ball lightning is formed. It basically, the lightning goes into the ground, it vaporizes some carbon and some silicon, and that forms a torus as it comes back out. If they actually say it's a soliton, it comes out, and then that burns in the air, creating a glow. 
right? That's and um, in, the BBC reached out of all people in the world to Graham Hubler at Naval Research Labs, who commented the fact that oh yes, we've been very interested for years in in uh, ball lightning and, and effects. Um, and this explains, you know, quite a lot of the observed phenomena, but I don't think it, something along the lines, I don't think it explains everything. That was then. In October 2001, uh, the Air Force commissioned a report um, for anyone in the world that knew anything about ball lightning technology and related effects. Um, and that was uh, conducted by Eric Davis. Eric Davis uh, also produced one of the propulsion uh, papers for the Air Force, and Eric Davis worked with um, Hal Potov. Hal Potov worked with Ken Shoulders, uh, uh, and Ken Shoulders worked with John Hutchison. But putting that aside, um, Eric Davis uh, concluded that uh, work that was conducted in the 1950s and 60s was one of the only things that could explain the, or one of the only approaches forward for um, ball lightning uh, research and the work of Ken Shoulders. And so in one division of the army, they are saying that Ken Shoulders work is one of the best ways to explore um, ball lightning other than still classified work that was done in the 1950s, seven, 1950s and 1960s. So moving forward, um, in, in I think around about 2010, um, Graham Hubler became the director of the Sydney Kimmel Institute for Nuclear Renaissance where I met uh, Stephen at ICCF uh, 19, uh, I think, Steve, Steve Bannister. And, um, or maybe I met, I met you in Colorado, I don't know. But anyway, it was, it, it was there. And he led that research for five years. Now his paper at ICCF 23 is saying that exotic vacuum objects are doing nothing more than causing a, an intense pressure pulse uh, uh, via columbic, uh, um, um, uh, uh, explosion onto the samples that uh, are being observed by uh, shoulders and that he gives an example of a, a military technology doing something similar using a shaped charge. I don't know whether he has not read much of Ken Shoulders work. I don't know uh, whether um, because he's ignoring the type of space, the, the effects on the channel through which the EVO goes, is ignoring the fact that if you have a piece of wax above the alumina, it is not affecting the, um, uh, the wax. And so if it was this massive pressure pulse, like, and it's also producing an atomic thin layer. And so um, it, 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 there's so many things that, that are not dealt with in this paper. I'm really interested to see it. And this is the beauty of ICCF, um, is that uh, there are so many different approaches being conducted, um, and some may be uh, challenging the narrative, and some may be um, supporting the narrative, and it's worth paying attention to. So I encourage, it is a little bit difficult for people in certain parts of the world, um, but I think they're starting most of the presentations in the afternoon, so it's reasonably okay for people in Europe. Um, and so I would encourage people to go and register and, and have a look. Um, and uh, um, I hope that they make all the videos available um, uh, online afterwards. I'm sorry that um, I can't share them on the YouTube channel, so... Um, what I will try to do for the ones that I see, I will try and, and give a view on them. Um, and I would encourage people to also give their own views on what they're seeing. So that's that. Um, so yes, go and have a look at ICCF. Um, unfortunately, many people can't go there and uh, many people aren't comfortable with working in the way that's being proposed for this conference. It's a great shame. I'm, it, it, in a conference like this, it's everything to be there, in my view, because you are meeting people, uh, as I've met several of the people on, on this discussion tonight, in person, and you get to know them. And it is really, really one of the most valuable things uh, that you can do. Uh, it, almost much more interesting than many of the presentations, which sometimes can be um, uh, repetitive, let's put it like that. Okay, so the last thing that I want to do, um, we've gone over time, but I just want to uh, walk through this if I can. I'm going to share a couple of images with you. 
And I've been through seven cameras, uh, five different lenses, six different pieces of software, um, and about six months. And I've got something that I'm now happy with. And um, I've been doing it on the, the Vega Valley. And this is uh, the work product of Henk using uh, Vega Experiment. And if you recall, it's two brass plates. And I will talk about the importance of brass in this um, in future presentations, but I don't want to go into that right now. But um, uh, on that, there are incredible structures. And I'm going to share in probably the, the best detail right now and discuss a few aspects of those. But um, let, let me see if I can share that window. Um, so I hope nothing goes wrong here um, because I'm now only on one screen, which is not good for this kind of thing. So let me see if I can do this. I, I'm going to plug in my other screen and I'm going to take out the network lead and hopefully it'll work. So bear with me a second whilst I try this switch. It might have been my computer overheating earlier that was the problem. So we're going to find out shortly. Right, I've got my other screen. I think I will do shortly. Uh -huh. So if anyone wants to say anything whilst I'm setting up quick, um, jump in. I just, I just comment. You mentioned something about a uh, uh, potential. Uh, funding resources or strategies. I hope we hear a little bit about that before we bow out. That's what I'm preparing you for. <laughs> oh, great, great, great. <laughs> I also want to point out there's kind of some consternation, which is like pretty understandable, but it's about sort of like, how are we going to, how can this actually work? Like what are we, what we're doing here? Um, but I just am observing like a real uh, genuine uh, like zeal for learning um, just in a pure sense. And I think that that's sort of probably going to be very inspirational um, going forward, like very <laughs> inspirational. So just, yeah, you guys are all really on the right track. Thank you so well, much. I look forward to seeing what you can share, actually. <laughs> but yeah, going forward, I mean... I don't know. Yeah, things will come together nicely, I'm sure. Cool. And my mother's screen hasn't come up yet, but <laughs> keep, 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 keep going. Uh, it might take a few more. <laughs> Jump in if you want to. Uh, I just put a uh, post in chat, but in case people aren't watching chat, uh, Eric Davis, I think, is still working with Hal Pudoff. Right, yes, yes. Yeah, I think And so. they're both spending, especially Pudoff, but I think Eric as well. I've seen him on a couple of videos on the UFO UAP phenomena space, which is a very interesting space. Um, you know, which you know, as again, as a social scientist looking for things that have huge implications for our social systems. Besides this one, that's yet another one. So I have a great interest there as well. You, you'll be surprised how many people in this space um, are also interested in that space. Maybe it goes with the territory. In in my case, um, it's personal experience, and um, I remember that. I I haven't. My, my personal belief about my experience was I do not believe my father uh, had a call from aliens and said we're going to put on a show for your kids. Um, but I do know that he was great friends and we're as well respected in the Marines in the UK uh, for the time he was in there. And um, as a very senior Mason as well, um, I think maybe a show was put on and bearing in mind I'm 48 now and I believe I was around about seven or eight. That was 40 years ago. And it was four craft. And um, uh, from my point of view, I think they are our tech. And that was 40 years ago. The things that I saw, and they were just glowing balls that moved in formation and, and, and moved with ridiculous speed and came to dead stop and then moved direction, moved direction, then disappeared. So um, from my point of view, um, uh, 
to to be this these numbers of years later observing the same things but in miniature in the vega experiments making these ridiculous changes in direction it's it's a bit weird i would never expect in my life to take that track pudov has a paper it's accessible it shouldn't i don't think it should be but it is <laughs> out of the geo that came out of the DOD uh, work he did at, at ATIF, mm -hmm. if anyone, you know, re, you know, uh, can relate to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, about the energy implications, if UFOs exist, you know, if, if, and which I think is sort of irrefutable at this point, something exists. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But the energy implications are huge. And again, as that's my primary interest in, in this whole space. Mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated by that. Uh, I don't know. You, you, do you know that the programmer of our um, the MFMP's reaction database and our Lenner events um, database? Uh, he actually uh, is uh, very intensely into UFOs. Oh, really? Yeah. So you know, um, I don't. I, I think we. What I liked about the Russian meetings is nothing was off the table. Um, and I would like, if we can achieve, I mean, it's been a bit of a mess today, but I, I'm in unusual circumstances in terms of my equipment. Um, but if we can achieve something similar, and that I've seen how fast they've gone, um, and, and the, the, you know, sometimes they're mocking the attitude to real science in the West, and I don't think it's without good reason, um, because there seems to be some approaches which are just uh, not allowed to be done at, at mainstream. And I think that's just an opportunity for us, really. Um, you know, um, but it's not to say that the mainstream hasn't discussed these things in the past, as I'm constantly finding. They haven't right. written, they've written patent, patents for them, they've written papers for them, even in respected journals. But I don't think people read stuff. I just, that's what I'm finding all the time. Just people don't care. They just don't read stuff. Well, and that's that, that, I mean, sorry, it makes me think about that genuine, pure desire to learn. You know, yeah. like you're out there like looking because you're just absolutely like splendidly on this unfolding journey that's exciting. And I'm sure just completely, uh, you know, life altering in every way. And so... Anyway, uh, getting people to truly enjoy picking up scientific papers that interest them and learning them, you know, uh, there's, there's just such a culture of uh, fear of learning, I mm -hmm. notice. And mm -hmm. just, I work in um, public education, actually, at the academic level. And um, yeah, I'm trying, I like work in um, IT training. So getting people to uh, switch over to like Microsoft Teams as like a way of work. So anyway, I just have like a lot of experience like with, you know, a, a wide age range of people learning technology. And uh, what has been very effective for me in those types of settings is demonstrate just as Bob does and, and everybody else here, like a genuine zeal for whatever's interesting us. So anyway, that's kind of just to, to circle back on that. So. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm going to try and share this now. And it's, I'm going from a much higher resolution screen. So um, I'm going to let's see. Oh, how do I share it when I'm the host? <laughs> uh, OK. Say, say something if you want to, Simon, whilst I see if I can share it. Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to say I've, I've met Hal put up a number of times at conferences. In fact, I think we might have met Bob because I was at the Global BEM conference in Boulder, Colorado, a number of years ago. I wasn't there. No, not that one. Oh, you weren't there. No, no. Not that one. Yeah. Got it. I was at another more. conference in Colorado. Yeah, that's where Mark Leclerc uh, presented his cavitation, unforgettable cavitation lecture. And uh, when I heard you years later, it really clicked back to everything he said there. Mm -hmm. But talking about Hal Putnam, I met Hal through remote viewing because that's how I got involved with these topics. I've met him at a number of conferences and we've talked uh, you know, after his presentations about all of this. And uh, what he's expressed to me is that 
the problem in the U.S. is there's too much classification. Everything gets stovepiped. And he has this fear that the U.S. will fall behind the rest of the world because nobody talks to each other here because so much of the science that's funded by the government is classified. And he said it deteriorates the quality of the science. So that's all I want to say. Simon, I think there's probably people here that would understand exactly what you're saying. And okay. I, I can tell you 100%, I have met several scientists who put a lot of their life into producing uh, even science directly in this field. I know at least two. And they're, they're not both in America. One is, one isn't. Uh, and they have had their pay patents effectively embargoed and they can't yeah. ever talk about them so they, right. they spent a lot of money they spent a lot of life they've got something that they think can support them into their old age and then they're told they will go to jail if they talk about what they've done yeah right there you go there you go yeah and uh, and by the way they didn't talk to me i made that up <laughs> i'm joking i'm not <laughs> but you know yeah so I have, I think this will work. So I'm going to try and share it now. So uh, what do I do? Hold, share, okay. Okay, now what happens? Can you see what I'm seeing? Oh, I don't know. Oh, can you see what I'm seeing? Yeah, it looks really yeah. good to yes, me. Yes. Okay, so um, this is part of the Vega Valley. Um, and I don't know what it will look back like when I zoom in. And I'll explain why there's a black box on there in a little while. Um, but there's a couple of features I want to draw out, and but we, I'm going to show you how beautiful the resolution is on this, if it's going to work. So here is one little caldera. Um, uh, this is at 100%, but um, this image is every pixel is the right color and it's a 16 bit and so you can print this as if it was a normal data pattern image at uh, four times its scale um, so you can actually make a very very large wall poster out of this particular image and what you can see is all of these structures are pointing in uh, orthogonal to the plasmoid that was in there um, even here, but as you go out here, they start to bend towards this area here as it's coming out. Now, was this because there was a liquid in here or was this because the plasma was in here? I don't know, but you can see here that there's an older structure here pointing into the main channel, but then something went over the top <laughs> uh, into this area. Now you're going to see this number of times. This is the in into the Evo uh, or mass structure that I'm, uh, I, as I understand it, and you have this fading out, but you've got this twist, and you've got this twist, and you've got this twist, and it's like you've got two structures or multiple structures that are twisting around each other in each of these fibers coming out. It's extraordinary. Um, uh, this. Uh, sample it really is now i'm going to talk in much more detail about detail about what i think is going on between these structures and these structures in a future presentation but uh, again i'm just going to show you some more detail in here um i don't i don't know how this is coming through on this type type of presentation i've got to say it's really beautiful and high resolution thank you okay great good okay so um, again, up here, if we look at this, if I zoom in, okay, you can see that there's two structures here. This one's going underneath over there, and this one's coming up. It, it, these are both at the same level. They're both pointing in to the overall structure. They tend to go in pairs. And I've talked about these being like a, 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 an ASEAN peninsula what, like you would get in Cambodia or Thailand, where they're they're so similar, um, but the, they come in pairs and this one is twisting under here and this is coming over here and twisting underneath. Again, we've got this one twisting over here and this one twisting underneath. It, the, the beauty in this is unimaginable. In, I could never have imagined when I looked at it, I, I knew it was important, but I, 
I could not have imagined it was like that, this important. Now look at this area. We've actually got multiple fibers like braided hair, one here, one here, one here. And then that is twisted around this, which is one here, one here, one here. And this is similar to the kind of active exotic vacuum objects, this sort of um, coherent matter um, plasma waves that we've seen in these various ejections from exploding um, uh, structures in the reactor. Here in this caldera, we have um, this hexagon structure here. You see it? Maybe here. So it has a pit in the middle, and then it's this hexagon structure in the side wall of this caldera. And again, in the caldera here, uh, everything is pointing in orthogonal, but they're grouped. They're in groups and they're semi regular spaced. And I will talk about the structure that I believe is causing this. Um, but I, I've probably given enough hints over, <laughs> over the last six or seven months that maybe when you see this, you can work out what's going on. Look, look at this. It's just stunning. It's just, it's just, uh, and this is just one small segment. Okay. Um, there's an area that's broken off here, and I'm wondering whether this is the kind of area where we, we've got the calcium type structures, because it does look like the Alan Goldwater found on some of the fragments that I sent in. We've got these holes in here, and I would like to see these even closer. Um, but perhaps this is, it's very porous. This does look like the kind of material that we found was calcium rich. And there's no calcium in the reactor. So this is the first of these. And like I say, I'll explain what uh, I've got the box there for in a little while. This is the second, and this was the title slide for this presentation. And this is a main channel, but it's a main channel elsewhere on the Vega Valley. And it, this is a sub one that obviously came under here. Now you can see it has a layer here and then another layer here. What is going on? It's like, this is the inside, but on the inside, that it's largely unaffected. Is this carbon? I imagine this will be carbon when we look at it. And so we could learn from this. When a plasma is this quantization, when a, a plasmoid or an exotic vacuum object is this quantization level, then this is the band over which it will produce carbon. And then whatever else is going on here. Don't know. This could be copper oxide, by the way, because we, we have a lot of copper in this well. So I'm going to look at a couple of these structures in, in a little bit more detail. Here, we've got a pair, which we've seen. We've got two, three sides of the hexagon here. So this is our figure of eight here that we've seen in so many different technologies now. It's a magnetohydrodynamic structure. Here's some affected plasmoids. This is maybe not so clear, but we get the fleur de lis at the top. It's like three coming together. Um, and why am I ident identifying these is I would like to go in with a different type of microscopy and see what is actually going on. So again, we've got a, a figure of eight here, but it's the end of a plasmoid channel. And down here, we've got one where it's actually, it, it might be a, a thin film effect, but we have our hexagon here on this side, and we have a smaller one on this side. And that is one that looks like the end point of a plasmoid channel. It's done something different. And so what I'm doing is I'm pre-screening areas I want to look at with a different microscope technology. Over here, we can see our three here together. And this is, again, at the end of a plasmoid channel or exotic vacuum object channel. And here, this one here is, a, is a, another figure of eight. It's a pair going together. And they're standing on their own, so they must have jumped from somewhere else. So this, it, the previous image I showed you was using a technology, uh, using stacked focus. This has not got stacked focus out on it. So some of it is out of focus. Um, and my machine is struggling now. Let's uh, we'll go over here. Here again, we've got um, one, two, three at the end of the plasmoid channel. 
So these are what I call fleur de lis. Sometimes you get a channel where it's completely different color. Okay. And uh, we've got an extreme version over here where it's just this wonderful blue color. So I would love to see what this particular channel is in terms of elements because it's so different from its surrounding areas and it's consistently different along the entire channel. It's not like uh, it dumps a material here and then it, it didn't have any more to dump over here. It's wherever it goes, it's that exact kind of proportion of material. So that's the second one I wanted to show you. And then there's this one. Now I've shown even higher resolution imagery of this area. I call this the Western Plateau, sorry, Eastern Plateau. And if you remember, there's a, there's a main channel that comes up above here. And this is leaking underneath the two sheets. We've got the two sheets of, of brass. And it's coming under there. And when you look at this, and we're going to look at this in close, but in this book that I have here, which was one of Ken Shoulder's principal um, references, it's called Vacuum Arts Theory and Application, published in. Uh, 1980, and uh, I think this paper is from 1979 that I'm referring to, and it's here. I've actually taken a quick shot of it, but it's it's this, and that is a copper plate. And I've got a shot of it that I can show you. Um, and here it is, and it says electrical breakdown in the vacuum, 72, and this is arc erosion pattern on a copper cathode. Now, of course, there was no reason for them to think that these kind of structures were anything other than the electric arc traveling along the copper, okay? Because the, the arc is directly impinging upon the copper plate, okay? But in this case, this is a bleed out from those main, main channels, those big, big plasmoids that made the fantastic structures you just saw. This is what's leaking out and it's traveling across this plateau and boring out these channels. If I go right in, you can see they are absolutely stunning. And again, I didn't take multiple focus levels on this. So um, I have a couple of areas I'd like to zoom into. So there's one over here, uh, maybe not so clear. And this is why I need to look at it with another technology. So you can see around the area with the hexagonal structures in the center spot over here, these two are overlaid with the center spot, one over here with the center spot. So this, this needs further looking at. I've got some down over here. I like this funny. Sorry. Okay. Okay. The door's open. The door that door just open. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, can you see this one here? Um, we've got three very, very distinct circular structures in there. This I would like to have a look under uh, much higher, um, under the SCM. And here is a kind of classic kind of blob. Now, the idea that this is be in, in the paper by um, Graham Hubler, he's arguing that a laser beam or an elect free electron beam is impinging upon a material causing a um, columbic explosion that accounts for the damage that you see on metals with exotic vacuum objects. That isn't what's happening here. Something has traveled a very, very long way from the main channel, doing all of this kind of damage, all of this kind of damage, all of this kind of damage, all the way out here, all the way up. It's not that simple. If you follow this channel over here, for instance, you can see the damage. And actually, on the 400 times microscope, it's, it's a little bit clearer what's going on. But anyway, you can see a better overview here. But all this damage, all this damage comes down here, goes around in circles, comes down here, goes down here, splits out. I mean, the energy in this thing to do this amount of disruption and continue and go down and go down and continue until it ends up here with our three structures on the end here. It's just extraordinary, the amount of damage that's going to go there. Okay, so why might you think am I putting these black spots on here? 
Well, the reason is this. I believe that we can, um, <laughs> you can't, so th these images are about 350 to 500 megabytes a piece. And that is compressed 16 bit tip. Okay, these are absolutely incredibly large images. But one of these images is only a small chunk of the Vega Valley. What I would like to do is this. I would like to make non-fungible tokens from these images and sell them on OpenSea or whatever um, and uh, as pieces of art. And so the reason I've taken a chunk out of those is so that I'm not publishing the full piece of art, but all of the information that we need to discuss is in the, the bit that I get left. And what if I was to publish this uh, image, because of its size, it would cost $50 million in ether to, to mint it, okay? So we get, what you intend to do is you publish a little thumbnail and you say that the person gains the digital rights to this product. And the idea is that if it works, then if it raises some money, then half of the money goes to the person that provided the material for me to produce these things. So I look at your thing, I make a fantastic image from it, if it is interesting, and there's a number of things that I can do this with. Um, that I've taken over the years for different researchers that all need money. And maybe you if you if you don't know anyone that's in this space, but you know someone that knows of someone, you could promote this because you put it up for an auction for a period of time and people can buy it. I don't I didn't know anything about NFTs until very recently. I still know very little. So this is this is a shot in the dark. But I, I do know that I asked the directors in 2014 if we should if we should consider mining Bitcoin to support our efforts. <laughs> and uh, uh, had we done, we probably would never have needed any money <laughs> to support our project. <laughs> um, NFTs are a real thing. There are people paying sensible amounts of money for it. And what you are potentially doing I believe that this particular sample is showing something so amazing that I believe in time this will be recognized for the importance of what it is showing. Um, and, I re and what you can do with an NFT is when something is sold on, you can actually get a, 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 an amount of money from the site resale. Okay, so it's not just the, the initial sale. You, if, if someone else thinks it's worth more, then the, the person can get some more money later down the line. So I don't know what people think. This is my idea. And I just want to show you something else that I've done with this. And I'm going to need to change my sharing. So don't go away. This will be the last thing I show. And then I'll take some last comments and any last suggestions. Because I actually have a three-dimensional projection of this Vega value sample. And it's rather beautiful because you then start to understand. It's like literally being in the Grand Canyon and understanding what you're looking at. And I would probably look to produce these and sell these at, with the NFT um, uh, as part of the package that the, the, the uh, uh, person secured. Right, so... Um, uh, And this hopefully might bring a whole new group of people to understand the, this science, because if you can create beautiful images out of science and you can print th these images on say metallic plates, you can actually get this chicken print process where they print onto aluminium and all the whitest parts come through with the aluminium. And so this would actually look metallic where it needs to look metallic. It would be a thing of great beauty. And you can, you can, and I can make a lot of these out of this one sample. Um, so um, give me a second. I'm just getting the image up here. And I'll share it again. Uh, and so it's this video. It's this, where is it, this video? Um, so, uh, uh, mm, mm. Okay, that's kind of isn't it? The machine doesn't fall over. Okay, 
if anyone wants to jump in, oh no, no, I've got it here. It, it should work. Now. Okay. All right. Let me see if it'll allow me to show you. Bob, um, I was thinking something. Go on. Uh, it reminds me uh, one of the website uh, uh, which, which is selling, you know, the templates for the website. And like, uh, if you want the, the website, uh, a copy of website, you can, I don't know, pay, pay 50 bucks. But if you want the original, only you have this website, you pay a little bit more, you know. So uh, like you can sell posters um, uh, many times you want. And you say, if you want the original, just you want, just uh, that you're the only one who has this picture, they pay a little bit more. So, so with, with NFTs, um, you can actually mint say like, like you can with real art you can mint say a hundred copies now the thing is you actually have to pay money to buy can you, you go back to about 30 seconds we actually lost you for a sec there okay so um you you can mint say um a uh, hundred copies like you do it and please. those people have the rights to print them. can you see me or hear me please repeat it oh can you hear me now can you hear me now no it's okay but when you start it just start to you know your sound okay. is I'm, I'm going to close photoshop because it's probably a memory constraint on, on this computer because i've just opened it, something else so bear with me i'm going to close photoshop Those giant five hundred megabyte uh, images. Yes, several several five hundred megabyte images loaded in. <laughs> hey, Bob. So it's just clearing the memory. Just clearing the memory from Photoshop. Okay, you're gonna like what I'm gonna show you though. I can tell you that. Okay. So if you can still hear me whilst Photoshop is currently clearing up its memory, <laughs> okay. um, uh, you can print, say, you, you can mint, say, 100 copies. And that's just some BS. We're, I don't know what's going on. That's so weird. Can you, can you hear me now? Right, right okay. until you get to the exact same spot in the sentence, and then it drops out in the exact same way because it's probably a really good idea that somebody doesn't want to. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to play the video. Can you hear that? Did you hear that? Right. Okay. Let me share the screen. Is I can't hear it or see it. I don't know if that's. You can't. No, not yet. <laughs> sorry, I don't know. <laughs> the machine is really struggling. Sorry. Okay. Can you see? Oh. Bravo. <laughs> can you see it? Can you see that? Okay.
Um, oh dear, it's struggling too hard. Okay, in, in my office, I have one machine for um, <laughs> compressing and doing the screen and <laughs> one for presenting on, and uh, obviously that could be the solution. Okay. Hey, Bob. I'm no, no, sorry. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I tried. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> hey, Bob. I have a close can I speak? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go, go for um, it. Yeah. Uh, listen, I, I have a current project that we're doing some uh, uh, micron scale uh, metal 3D printing. If we can get this data in a format, that I can import it into our CAD system, I can 3D print that at scale. If the data that you get on your 3D imaging, we can convert into a format that I can read into my CAD system, I can 3D print that in metal in incredible detail and surprisingly, surprisingly cost-effective. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I have to say, um, I will have to do a better job because um, this is only six, um, six levels of depth of which it's interpolating it from. I can actually take as many as I like, um, but every time I take another depth level, it's another half terabyte. Um, so, so uh, sorry, how, how close, I mean, did, does anybody know software well enough to say like the, maybe the VR implications here even? Oh, I can give you a VR just... implication. Let, let, let me just, let me show you a stereo image. I mean, it'd be so fun to put on the goggles and walk around this canyon. You know what I mean? Like, I like exploring the Grand Canyon. Um, okay, let, let me, I'm going to sh stop share and I'm going to share something else. Because that, it's having a problem sharing the videos. Let's stop share and let me share something else. Share. Uh, these are 4K videos. Maybe I should have chosen something that's a little less demanding. If, if you're okay, I'm okay. I have a meeting in the morning, but I can probably, I can probably be okay. Let me, let me get, I've got, I've got a stereo image for you. Let me throw in an economist thought. Um, I guess yeah. I get dragged dragged into uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, NFT by my students. So, so, so I have to pay attention to some of this. Uh -huh. One thing I do know, uh, very recently, the NFT market seems to be, um, I don't want to say collapsing, but you know, at least retracing. So it's not as uh, active as it was, or at least, you know, the potential isn't. So if you're going to do it, don't spend a lot of money going into it and do it pretty quickly before the market dries up. Although these are spectacular images. So just from an art standpoint, let alone scientifically. But maybe I can choose some more traditional route uh, yeah. where people can buy just a straight poster. Yeah. Well, and, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say don't try it. I just... Um, what I've heard, and I, I don't, I don't follow the market daily NFTs, but but I've heard that they're, you know, the market is softening quite a bit. Okay, well, um, my my view on these. What it's worth, Bob? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think I think you're right, but um, you know, in in terms of Bitcoin, um, uh, I, I remember uh, turning down buying Bitcoin when there were just a few dollars. Oh, um, I know. And I, I've I've heard this. They are. They are an asset which there's a limited supply. But and but the that's correct. But the only the only link between Bitcoin and NFT is the underlying blockchain technology. I mean, it's a no, no, no. It's run on ether. <laughs> the, yeah. the, right. the NFTs are run on ether, which is it's contract. You are buying the digital rights to the file. So 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 on on on, uh, on cryptocurrencies, I've got a whole separate point of view. You guys would bore you guys because it gets you know way too much and done. Uh, 
Actually, no. Why not, Steve? Let's let's have a question on your understanding of that. Why not? Well, here's my point of view. Um, governments like to have a monopoly on currencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and they do have the means to enforce it. And if cryptocurrencies start to intrude on that. And they haven't because they have very few characteristics of, of our currency. I mean, it just they don't they don't work the same. They're not they're not being used very widely at all in transactions. I don't see the evidence that they they are or even may be. Uh, so they're pure, they're a speculative investment right now. But if they do start to intrude in the real currency space, I have no doubt. <laughs> that central banks will get into that business by themselves and shut down all of the private operators. You know, it'll be like, you know, you're counterfeiters and you go to jail if you do it. That's, I, my, that's, my, that's my take on crypto currency. I, I think, I think the, certainly for the Chinese government, they realize that, that it probably is the best way to create a, a, a transfer token. Um, however, yes. I'm not, I'm not saying that the technology doesn't have value, but when it has sufficient value, what I'm saying is because of the, this love of governments to, to have a monopoly on currency issuing, they're going to do what they can, and I think they can do a lot to shut it down. That's all I'm saying. So, but that's separate from what we're doing here. I mean, there's, and I, I get into, uh, you know, quite interesting debates over this, of course, People have made millions, billions of dollars in, in crypto. It's just ridiculous, unbelievable. And it's very you know, attractive to a bunch of people, but it's a very speculative investment. So, so what I tell my students after teaching about the gold standard and its history and all that is that cryptocurrencies are essentially a current a modern substitute for gold right now. They're specu very speculative and, and you can't make jewelry out of them. So, um, you know, um, that. Well, yeah, I, I will say that the, the um, ether does appear to be a lot more than that. I, I would agree on the argument for um, Bitcoin because it can't have any other function, but, but you can build so much off ether. It, I mean, it's a smart contracts platform. Yeah, that's and, the blockchain. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish anything, truly. Yeah. I'm just making observations about what government's like. And I, I think the Chinese government, the People's Bank of China, and the Fed, our Federal Reserve here in the U.S. has started talking about uh, digital, you know, issuing digital currency. So I, and probably based on uh, blockchain or some equivalent technology, but, um, and I'm sure the Bank of England probably, you know, I think the Bank of England has done the same. I'm not so sure about that, but, but at any rate, it, it, it is, uh, um, it's an important technology. I'm not trying to diminish this at all. However, when you get into currency issuing, I will repeat, governments want a monopoly. <laughs> and our, our Federal Reserve currently has a monopoly in the US, the Bank of England has a monopoly in the UK. And so, and there are a dozen other countries where it's similar. Not, uh, well, uh, the EU is by the central bank instead of the countries, which is a bit of a problem, but that's the way it is right now. But at any rate, they like to be the, the only, you know, the monopoly issuer of currency, and they'll take strong action to, um, so to defend that position. That's all I'm saying on the currency, not about technology at all. Yeah, I, I, th I think you're right. Um, I know that... Um... Uh, there's this pay system in East Africa where they just transfer money on the phones and it became fantastically yeah. possible. Um, fantastically, um, like everyone was using it, like no one was using normal currency. Um, yeah. I mean, it, I think in Kenya, it, it happened like in a few months. So, so quick. Yeah. Because people just have a cheap Nokia phone. I, and they... I don't know what the monetary structure is in Kenya. I'm yeah. sorry, I just don't understand. Oh, that's okay. that. So, um, yeah, I tried my hardest to get my computer to do more than just grunt to its death. So I apologize to everybody for filling in with boring economics while Bob is trying to get the video working here. <laughs> I, I think it was very useful. Oh. Um, <laughs>
my my view on these matters is is that um, uh, I, the, this is a non traditional space of research, <laughs> and and um, I think it's quite fitting to use a non traditional uh, way of um, getting the message out there. And if there is any buzz about this, most of the NFTs that are being traded are uh, very very small GIF animations. Um, of nearly nothing of venue interest at all, or you have these brilliant artists that are putting out their finest work and they're getting very reasonable returns from it. I don't know what this will be considered as, but if the project could take, uh, create artwork of this caliber and uh, it get recognized uh, in a broader community um, as being the first sort of scientific evidence put out there uh, um, in this way, just just the media hit on that could bring a lot of new eyes to the field. And so I'm, I'm not just thinking about it as a potential way to support researchers, but I would like to see incredible images of Slobodan's diamond-like structures um, that are being produced with HHO gas. Uh, the Lion Nebula, the, the beautiful, perfect nickel crystal nebula-like structure from the Lion reactor, that would make a great piece of NFT art. And, and, and so, so again, I, to be clear, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm just trying to inject oh, no, what you're the, absolutely I, right. I'm, 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 I'm not, not discouraged. discouraged. <laughs> it's just that it would be, I think you would be, well, well you it, uh, putting a lot of money into piloting this might not get rewarded given the market realities now. So you should be able to, if you can figure out a way to try it without, I, I don't know what it costs to publish an um, NFT of it. Well, this is, uh, what I'm saying is if I took the image that I showed you and removed the box from it that you saw, the box yeah. that of this area in the 2D image, if I, if I, um, put that, the ether to publish that in the network would cost $50 million. No, I understand. That's, it's an so, impressive image. No, 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 no. That is the cost of the publishing it. I understand. So I understand. what I'm saying is what I would take is a very small thumbnail of it. And I would say I would have another platform to show a higher quality version of the image and, and say it's for sale go to this account and what people are doing is they they painted one oil painting or they painted yeah. one acrylic and they give a little thumbnail that goes into the ether for a small fee yeah. and then they say whoever gets the contract to own this art gets the physical item sent to them in yeah. this case i would send them the physical digital item and then they would have the yeah. digital rights to the item to sell it on to print it do what the hell they like with it uh, I, I get you. And, and time, sorry to interrupt, but no. timed properly, like with the TEPCO RFP, I mean, just depending on how things go, I mean, you know, that's having something like this in mind as sort of like a, just a bit of a thing to try, kind of, you know, uh, it just seems really on point. So um, that's that's basically, I, I finally got it here. I killed me on the screen and you can now see it smoothly rotating. So I'm going to show you the other image. But with... You, when I rotate this round and do this, the image from the other side, you learn so much more about it. Um, and this is such a small thing. So I, I can tell you about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars have gone to to find a way to do this. Um, that might not seem a lot to people who had big bun, budgets to manage in the past. And, but I've certainly availed of the European Union's two-week rule to send something back and get all the money back. <laughs> hey, I want to. I want to know what those luminous, luminous-looking structures are. That's kind of here. Peaked. Yeah, yeah, and a couple more. Yeah. I, I, I think these are fragments. Either of something that they're the last thing that got left in this area, or they are fragments that came off somewhere else, and the, the plasmoid came along again. And it interacted differently around them because the plasmoids tend to wet over a certain surface. Yeah, I think that well, they, go on. They, they almost look. They almost look like they're back illuminated. That's their um, appearance. 
Yeah, but what you're, what you're seeing is the original brass here around the outside, so it's less affected. This, this is likely based on the SEM images we've done. The black stuff is either cop copper oxide or it's carbon, and it tends to be a lot of carbon. Um, and you're going to see some other stunning images in the, the when I do this work. I mean, just let, let me go and show you the close up again. Um, one, and then we'll probably close out because I've got to be up really early in the morning. So we'll, we'll go back into the close shot here. And I'll come out of that and share it. And this works with one screen. It obviously has a problem with two screens. It's just too much. So at least I know for the future. So can everyone see that? Um, and if I press play, uh, there we go. Of course, because I'm taking the photo down, there is some smearing here because it doesn't have any data from here to here. Now I could take a different shot where I had the camera at angle and do many more focus stacking and I would know what the da data is on this side, but I'm not gonna go to that level. So if I send you a data set, David, and yes, I'm very interested in having this in 3D, I would choose the most awesome area of it. I would then, Rather than having six or seven stacks on the focus, I would probably do about 30. Now, the end image is the same size, but I, because of the, the optics involved, I literally can't breathe when I'm taking the photos. <laughs> because yeah. you, you have a 50 megapixel sensor and it's shifting that sensor half of one, one pixel because it's a Bayer sensor. So it, it's, it's doing pixel shift. It's a Sony Alpha camera, Alpha One. And it's, it's shifting it one, one, one Bayer element. And then it's shifting it down and shifting it to the left. So when it takes its four images, I can't breathe. You can't have a tram running by. It's, it, you have to be very sensitive. Now, every time I add another focus stack, it adds another layer of registration issues, potentially. So, but I, I, will, I will try and I, already I'm seeing that to, to hold this in my hand would be quite magical. <laughs> but you, you, you can see a lot from 3D. That, you know, I got the software so we can actually look around this thing. Why don't we do that? And then I really will go to sleep. <laughs> Bob, you are gonna like wreck yourself, my friend. You are go, go, go. I, I respect it though. <laughs> I, I, I love just, it. I love, I love it. When he, when he gets in, when when Bob gets into these pictures, he gets so soft and reverent spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Mesmerizing. I, I, it's like been the. I mean, yeah. I'm. Ex yeah. There's beauty in science. It's it's I, beautiful. There's beauty in mass, but that can be someone else's beauty. <laughs> If, if people can't get it just within a few seconds of using their senses, then that, it's always going to be a problem. And, and it's like this book, Vacuum Arcs. If you look in the library, it's only been booked out once since it was bought by the library. And it was in the library in 1980. We, Bob, will you, what is the title of the book? I'm going to go look in our library. Vacuum Arcs, Theory and Applications. And when you look at this, it, it's got it's got Evo strikes in there. It's got, I mean, it's like. <laughs> Who's the author again? Oh, it's multiple authors. And it was, it's J.M. Lafferty. L.A. J.M. Lafferty. 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 Okay. Okay. I'll go look. And it was actually in, in Colorado when I was sitting there looking at a particularly boring presentation. Um, <laughs> Hey, Steve, if you find two copies, you let me know. I'll come drive up there and take the second copy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, you'll see this in my um, Sochi presentation, but I was sitting in Colorado and I'd worked out that these things, they form these rings which seem to grow and they have these regular structures around them. Well, on page 150, I just happened to be sitting there and there it is. They'd actually quantized it here. Back in 1980, on 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 cathode arts, it, no wonder this was a principal reference of shoulders. 
but I found there was when I bought that, I think there was two or three copies available on Amazon. And uh, that was it worldwide. <laughs> so you can probably find one on Amazon if you quickly get on there now before the rest of you do. <laughs> um, right, let, let me find 3D software because it's freaking cool. <laughs> uh, okay, guys, I will just, just say uh, goodbye. Uh, I have to go tomorrow work. Yeah, so me it too. It was uh, very, very nice to, to talk to you. Um, well, fantastic. We can talk once again very soon. So have a good night, everyone. Or oh, good day for someone like here. <laughs> so uh, see you see you soon. Thank you, Slobodan. Bye. 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 Okay, here we go. My model is what's it? What is it? This one. Okay. Right. Let me share the screen. Uh, here we go. All right. Can you see that? Beautiful. So I can actually go in here and I can actually rotate that round. So we can go and have a look at the other side. If anyone's feeling queasy, that I do too. <laughs> so we can have a look at this edge where you've got these lovely structures. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to tilt it up that way. Uh, and if I just stop that rotating for a second, just put the rotation down to zero. Oh no, now it's going to do something stupid. No, sorry. Excuse is me. it like in a zero gravity universe in there? I mean, what is this? It's so funny. It's got this rotation and stuff. Just uh, want well, on, on, the on the right, you can see your like zoom controls and stuff. So um, it's, it's just a 3D plane uh, with displacement on. It's, it's a, a normal 3D mapping technique. I, uh, the, for those that don't know, I had a 3D animation business for yeah, most of my life, most of my career. So now, now it's struggling. I'm sorry, now it's struggling. It doesn't like doing this real-time 3D. So um, anyway, you can see that's the software and we get to look at this from different angles and, and understand what the, the plasmoids did to the material in a way that is just not possible in, in any other sense. Um, and uh, this is actually just using optical photography, effectively, but extremely, extremely good <laughs> optical photography. With a, I'm using a five times one, five to one times macro lens, um, and then a 50 megapixel image uh, thing. So it's tough, but. It, it does the job. So that's, that's, the, that's six months of effort to try and get this process. But now I can do it every day of the week. So there we go. I'm going to kill that now. So if anyone, is, is anyone else want to say anything uh, before we shut out today? And my machine has now gone to 100 degrees centigrade and stopped. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I, I'm done. David, you want to say something? Or Dan, do you want to say something? Oh, nothing. I was just uh, say I'm taking pity on your computer processor at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's bearing in mind it's recording this stream, broadcasting, yeah. and it's doing 3D with that kind of data. Yeah, it's Atlas holding up this whole stream. <laughs> so well, I, I really appreciate everything. Okay. So my, my library search says there's at least one copy in our library of vacuum arcs. Uh, and I doubt if it's been checked out. <laughs> so I'm going to check it out. Fantastic. Well, enjoy it. It, it. it tells you, you know, there's something in there that I'm going to talk about in something electric part two. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know what it is. It's something that is in many valves and that is 
a titanium hydride pill. Huh. And all you do, it has a little heating element in there and it releases hydrogen into the valve. And huh. when you turn the, the heat down, it then goes back into the titanium. And that is in a book that was published in 1980. Right. And That's everyone good. used to think that was a clever thing that Rossi did. Having a hydrogen generator in the cell, but it's standard valve technology from the 40s or something. Okay, this brings up there. I just saw them, somebody on YouTube was reconstructing like the Farnsworth fusion reactor, which was basically a tube as I understand it. Just uh, some sort that was able to do, I don't know, like yeah, tube liner. So uh, yeah, it just seems like, yeah, it's all kind of coming together. So what I'm trying to think of is how I can design a, a, a reactor, a simple reactor. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work to something that's going to cost about 15 to $20 and can be built with pieces off eBay. I can't guarantee it will work. But when you see what has happened in one of the Vega experiments, it's so special. And I have already prepared the media for this happening for about three years and i never i never expected to see it but it's been done and it is a free floating fireball this is in my view a coherent matter structure that is not contacting any other solid material and it's it's stable as long as any tokamak has been stable for and it's self-confining itself and with this we should be able to create a direct electrical generator. Now you have my attention. Okay. <laughs> so one, one thing is to make, and I'm and, and sorry, you can build it out of plumbing supplies. I, it's hilarious. Even, and, I, even I, as an economist, will try this. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best pair of speakers that you can actually own not quite but one of the best is less than 30 dollars in materials and people don't know these things so just throwing that out there i want a presentation on that too because i want some new speakers in this house <laughs> so yeah Bob, you're, yeah you're so soft maybe your children are uh, going to going to bedtime or something there for sure uh, <laughs> long about four hours ago uh, we've we've got to talk more about this. This is uh, are you, so you're putting a presentation together on that in the near term. It's going to be so. I I want to talk about the Vega Valley. I want people to understand. I've been talking about the fact that these structures they all always like to form the um, uh, the allotropes of carbon, and their clustered and nested ag aggregates. This is what they seem to form. And I think if you think of what I've showed you about the Vega Valley, and you think about that, and you see what you see in those, those images, it will make sense. But I had concluded this before I saw that. <laughs> and, and when you understand the, 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 how, how it occurs as it goes out, the, the, the different shapes in structures, when I show you, how I see that forming. There's so much science out there that just tells you how this is working. It's already been done. Anyway, so that's one side. So I need to do that. I need to talk about what's in the Parker Mod book. So that's a simple presentation I'm gonna do this week, but I'm, I'm leading up to something electric part two. And in there, um, I don't want it all to be done. I want there to be a lot to do for other people. But when you see what I will show you, and certain people in this stream might know what I'm talking about, but in context of the, the, the images and videos I've been saving over the last two years before I saw this, you will know that this is how it is. And you will know from patents as early as 1973 that this is the structure. And that by feeding it in a certain way, you can keep it stable. And it's it, it, you can see it stable and you can see it stable for seconds, which means you can make it stable for a very long time. Correct. You just need to know it's stable for a little time. And, <laughs> and that's, you know, exactly, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what we're working on. <laughs> right. 
we, you, you're going to see it and then it's going to be so obvious but um uh it, i mean you can't unsee it when you've seen it and it's just so obvious and when you think when you think how you can reduce that down to its bare essentials you will know you can make it out of plumbing supplies <laughs> okay and so i'm trying to think i was trying to think how do i if someone hasn't got an evacu a vacuum chamber you know right. a vacuum pump how do they get a vacuum environment which just has hydrogen in there and, and low pressure residual air oh i'm sure you had to do that that's no big deal well no big deal at all why, if you can do a presentation on that would be great but what, creating create, creating a vacuum without a vacuum pump uh, well, you can you can do it by uh, having a gas and then like a, even even water gas and, oh, and then oh, condensing it. There's 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 a really simple, clever way to do it. Uh, it, it 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 will stun you, and, and we'll we'll follow up on that. And so maybe I it. can build a demo or something. We can take a look at it. That would be so, great. So you you get yeah. a toxic vacuum. You then have some getter in there to grab a load of other gases. And then you have your, your titanium hydrogen pill in there, which you can just put your hydrogen in that you need. And the combination of those things should be something that can be done by a basic experimentalist with stuff that they can buy on eBay. And that's what I'm targeting towards. Did you get that? I, I didn't Fantastic. follow all of it, but but Bob, my ears, my ears were gone 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can turn it we'll up. Follow later. up. <laughs> okay. All right. Don't guys. worry. So with that, so yeah. I have to say thank you very much. Uh, there's two chats down here. We'll this, this was, I, I have to say, this was great. It was nice really meeting everyone. Yeah. And, sure. uh, yeah. Oh, great absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I look forward to the, you know, to the next, next things. Okay. So I have made a recording. Does anyone have an objection for me publishing it? No That's objection. As long as you share. <laughs> 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 okay guys so with that i'll say thank you very Thanks. much thank you perhaps we'll have another one in a month's time if anyone is in the uk and uh, i can join them that'd be great if anyone is in holland or sorry in in, in holland and netherlands and uh, um, wants to uh, work in this field more directly please reach out or if you know someone that is i do know some people if they're not on this stream i'll try and reach out to them and, and Hank's interested in uh, collaborating and having someone to talk to <laughs> in his own language. <laughs> so thanks. Hank, it's great to meet you, by the way. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I hope to see you at a conference soon, even if we have to make one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Catch you later, guys. That's for me. Bye. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Thanks everybody. a lot, guys. Right, great to meet everybody. Great to meet you.